This meeting is now called to order. Let's say good morning. good morning. Oh, I like that. I like that. The teachers up here like that. It's good, good. Oh, it's afternoon. Uh, thank you. Good, good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, so I want to thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Council Member Debbie Rose, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Youth Services. And I just want to um, acknowledge before I go on with my remarks um, that today we are celebrating the International Day of the Girl. And as we hold these hearings about programs that help young women and men learn, grow, and thrive, we join the international community in bringing attention, action, and enthusiasm to lifting up young women and providing them a path to forge forward. So um, I, as you go through your day today, remember to acknowledge um, young women. So today we are conducting an oversight hearing on DYCD programs, SYEP, Compass NYC, and SONIC. And a little later I'll tell you what those ac the acronyms for. I would like to thank the speaker, Corey Johnson, for his commitment to the youth of New York City. I would also like to thank the young people themselves. I want to thank youth advocates, program providers, and all those that come to testify today. Finally, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues who have joined us this afternoon. And my colleagues are Council Member Eugene, the former chair of this committee, and Council Member Chin. Youth in New York City are an overwhelmingly important population. They are the future and thus need adequate resources to grow. That is why DYCD has invested <coughs> excuse me, in numerous programs in an effort to provide for these youth. Of the programs DYCD funds, today we would like to focus on three specific programs. SYEP, which is an acronym for Summer Youth Employment Program, Compass NYC, which is an acronym for Comprehensive After School System of New York City, and SONIC, which is Schools Out New York City. SYEP is an integral program for teaching youth about the meaning of hard work, as well as the importance of a stable job in one's life. SYEP provides youth between the ages of 14 and 24 years old with paid summer employment for up to six weeks during the summer. A host of providers throughout all five boroughs offers youth the opportunity to work in entry-level jobs in a variety of industries, such as education, finance, media, entertainment, manufacturing, and retail, on top of providing youth with the opportunity to develop their skills in what many will be a first job. SYEP also provides workshops on job readiness, career exploration, financial literacy, and opportunities for educational advancement and social economic, socioeconomic growth. SYEP is something near and dear to my heart. I am pr very proud to say that my first job was SYEP. And um, I'm really excited that we worked really hard to secure more funding and slots during this past budget season. In addition to SYEP, Compass New York City, and a subpart, Sonic, is extremely important for youth to have high quality after school programming. Compass NYC and Sonic are influential in developing youth into successful and prosperous individuals. Compass NYC and Sonic is made up of more than 900 programs serving youth enrolled in kindergarten to 12th grade at no cost to youth who participate, with programs being strategically placed in all facets of a youth life within public and private schools, community centers, religious institutions, public housing, and recreational facilities throughout the city. Notably, Compass NYC has four major models, one of which is Sonic that are all based on improving opportunities for youth to explore different interests and subjects, integrating STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math, into traditional 
programming, as well as creating strategies to support youth and families. I look forward to learning more about DYCD and what they are doing in terms of these programs, as well as understanding provider concerns and comments on these programs. One subject of particular interest that I hope to look at during this hearing is funding of these programs. I wish to thank my staff, um, Edwina Martin and Issa Rogers, and the committee staff, Paul Senegal, Kevin Katowski, and Michelle Peregrine. And um, with that, we will swear in our first panel. In accordance with the rules of the council, I will administer the affirmation to the witnesses from the mayoral administration. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council members' questions? I do. Please state your names for the record. Andre White. Hello. Is it? Is that working? Um, yes. Okay. <coughs> Andre White. And Susan Haskell. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Rose and members of the Committee on Youth Services. I am Andre White, Associate Commissioner for Youth Workforce Development. I'm joined by Susan Askell, Deputy Commissioner for Youth Services. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about DYCD's programs, specifically the Summer Youth Employment Program and the Compass and Sonic Comprehensive After School Programs. I'm thrilled to report that this past summer, SYP was budgeted to serve 75,000 young people ages 14 through 24 and connected them to jobs at over 13,000 work sites throughout the five boroughs. Last summer, the program's budget, program's budget grew by 18% to a new eye of $150 million. Worksite development increased by 14%, exposing participants to a wider array of opportunities um, in the city. 44% of worksites were in the private sector, 41 in the nonprofit organizations, 15% in government agencies. SYP participants worked in financial, cultural, media, entertainment, and healthcare industries. Examples of such placements include Bank of America, a and &E Networks, The Met, and My Mamadi's Hospital. We're grateful the council recognizes that SYP is a vital program that helps young people gain work experience, explore careers, build skills, and prepare for their future. With the administration and the, and the city council's commitment to SYP, together we have made incredible progress. Mayor Bill de Blasio has more than doubled the size of SYP over the past five years and baseline funding for 70,000 slots. This has allowed DYCD and its providers to plan the program more effectively and ensure that the development of quality job placements. This helps providers better manage the staffing of the program and develop more robust project-based experiences for participants. Stable funding has translated into a higher quality summer job experience for youth, and for that, we're truly grateful. Our work is not done. Later this month, we plan to release several RFPs for SYP in order to have new contracts in place for summer 2019. The program design builds on the recommendations from the Youth Employment Task Force commissioned in June 2016 by Mayor Bill de Blasio and former Speaker Mark Viverito. The task force was comprised of a broad array of stakeholders including advocates, providers, foundation, and nonprofit leaders. The task force focused on how to bring relevant, innovative workforce experiences to young people through SYP. The recommendations that will be incorporated into the RFPs include strengthening the connections between SYP providers and public high schools to improve in-school career development for young people, serving younger youth through career exploration and project-based learning experiences, and enhancing support services, including pre-program orientation and counseling to help, meet the to help meet the unique needs of vulnerable populations. We encourage all community-based organizations that are considering applying for a contract to begin the pre-qualification process with HHS Accelerator, which is managed by the Mayor's Office of Contract Services. Organizations can register there for automatic notification of the release of the RFPs. 
Susan Asko, DYCD Deputy Commissioner for Youth Services, will now discuss other topics in today's agenda, the Compass and Sonic Schools Out New York after school programs. Uh, the, after, the comprehensive after school system of New York City, Compass, is comprised of more than 920 programs serving young people in grades K to 12. Through a network of providers, Compass offers high quality programs that have a balance of enrichment, recreation, arts, academic, and cultural activities to support and strengthen the overall development of youth. Compass aims to help young people explore interests and skills develop social emotional learning and cultivate leadership through service learning and civic engagement activities. Through a continuum of after school programs from Compass Elementary to Sonic for middle school students to Compass High, DYCD helps support young people on a pathway to success. Programs are offered at no cost and are located in public and private schools, community centers, and parks and recreation facilities throughout the city to leverage the use of public space to help youth find a place that best fits their needs. With the Compass Middle School expansion, the city now has capacity to provide a high quality after school seat to every New York City middle school age youth. In addition, in 2015, Compass launched a program to serve middle school youth in detention and in homeless shelters. And in collaboration with ACS and the Department of Homeless Services, DYCD funded providers offered tailored programming at six locations that cultivate supportive relationships and encourage participation in enrichment activities. Fiscal year 18 was the fourth year since the historic ex expansion of after school programs under the leadership of Mayor de Blasio. Last year, more than 126,000 young people were served in Compass. Of these, 52,000 were served in 323 elementary school programs, and 69,000 middle school youth were served in 496 Sonic programs. Compass Elementary and middle school programs are offered five days a week after school on some school holidays. The programs aim to foster social emotional competencies and physical well-being, provide opportunities for youth to explore interest and creativity, build confidence and leadership skills, and facilitate community engagement, and engage parents and other caregivers. The middle school model Sonic is structured like clubs where youth have the opportunity to choose from a variety of activities, including STEM, literacy, leadership development, and healthy living. Compass High is designed to help high school ninth graders navigate their new surroundings and matriculate to 10th grade. In addition to the advocacy within the community, the Compass High model offers targeted academic, social, and emotional supports. Last year, approximately 1,500 youth participated in Compass High School programs. Compass Explore allows providers flexibility to create programs with a specialized focus for different age groups. Explore programs offer a variety of activities from preparation for legal careers to boat building. Last year, 2,500 youth participated in 30 Explore programs. We're excited for this school year and we've supported our programs through a successful start. We look forward to our continued to partnership with City Council to meet the needs of the city's youth and to create opportunities for them to grow and thrive. Thank you for the invitation to testify and we're prepared to answer your questions. Thank you. So um, in order to have uh, developed the RFP and, um, and the, uh, the document, the concept paper, um, I'm sure uh, data collection was an important aspect of it. Um, and before I, I go on, I want to thank the task force who worked really hard um, to put together the, uh, the concept paper. Um, and so how does DYCD collect data and information? Um, for example, timesheets and, and other documentation. And in the past, there's, there was reference to DYCD being in the process of overhauling and standardizing its data collection systems, specifically for SYEP. Could you tell me what the status is of this process and, um, and has it streamlined things as well as the economic, the economic impact on the system? Sure. Um, so we, we currently use um, a database system that our providers are expected to utilize um, from the recruitment process all the way through payroll. And essentially, the purpose of this database system is to make sure that providers have all the resources necessary to track participants as soon as they apply all the way until they're placed. Um, so currently, 
in terms of timesheets, I want to address that first. Um, how the program operates currently, once a young person is placed at an employer, the provider is responsible for visiting that employer on a weekly basis to collect the timesheets, right? And also to make sure that they're engaging the young people to ensure that they're having a meaningful summer job experience. Once that process is done, then the provider then goes back to their offices and enter that time into our payroll system. Once a payroll system has been, I'm sorry, once the time has been entered into the payroll system, DYCE then is approved the time and young people get paid a week or two later. So um, uh, we've heard from providers that there's an inordinate amount of paper. Um, have you been able to streamline this process? We, we've been thinking about how do we move away from collecting as much paper as possible. Um, unfortunately, because of our oversight agencies, which, which include um, the New York State uh, ODTA office, right, that standard funding that we get a lot of funding for, for SYP, they do require physical copies of all the required documents. So for example, they want to see in a participant folder the actual application. They want to see young people um, supporting who they are, so identity documents. They want to see income documents for the parents, right? Um, or thinking, at DYCD as we develop SYP 3.0 is how can we move to a more electronic system? And that's definitely on consideration to figure out how can we build a system to have providers upload documents in the database. Um, we're still in the very early stages of having those conversations, um, but it's definitely under consideration. And the economic impact on the system? Are you asking the, the mm -hmm. costs in terms yes. of why? So mm -hmm. ag again, we have just actually had a conversation with the vendor that we we're working with, um, and they're looking into what that cost might be. Um, so I, unfortunately, I could get back to you with, with that, that amount. I'm not sure what's going to be. OK. Um, how many youth um, by program, according, I wanted to break it out by program, Compass, Sonic, and SYP apply but are denied um, an opportunity to participate in the program? I'll, I'll start with SYP and then I'll add it over to Susan to talk about Compass and Sonic. Um, I think it's important to understand with SYP, although we did receive over 160,000 applications. 160,000? Yes, correct. Not every young person that applies for SYP actually works, right? So for example, they might have to go to summer school, mommy and daddy might decide to take um, you know, take them down south, see auntie and uncle to, to spend the summer. Um, and interestingly enough, in order to place 75,000 young people this summer, we had to make over 122,000 offers um, to, to get up to the 75,000 number. Okay. Sonic and Compass? Um, t combined Compass, which includes Sonic for fiscal year 18, is um, was... 126,000 young people. Okay, and Compass. Um, that includes the ele that includes um, young people at all levels: the elementary, the middle, and the high school youth. 126,000 young people. So, um, so um, I guess over half of the the young people that apply for these jobs. Um, are not are not getting them, right? You would say are denied. No, I I wouldn't say that. I would actually say um, we made offers to over seventy four percent of the applicants. Well, seventy four percent of the applicants get jobs. We made offers. Get correct. Oh, you make offers. Okay. Yes. Um, what are you know your common reasons for rejecting applicants? SYP is a lottery-based system, um, so young people, once they apply to our program, mm -hmm. they have an opportunity to select a provider, which is a local CBO, many of whom I see in the room today, um, to work with for the summer. Um, once they log into our online system, they'll see a listing of working opportunities, different types of work site that provider might be able to offer them. Once they apply to that provider, their application is then put in what we call the lottery pool. Um, in May, sometime around May, we run the lottery, for SYP, um, and if you're lucky or blessed, um, you're selected for a summer job. Um, and that process continues until all slots are filled. So um, with Compass and Sonic, 
Um, are there, what are the reasons for young people not being accepted into the program? Is Com it the number of slots that are available? Compass and Sonic operates differently than SYP mm -hmm. in that enrollment is handled locally by the community-based provider at the site. Um, SYP has a, um, he had a question, I'll turn it off while he's talking, so it doesn't keep the voice and sound, sorry. Um, so we don't have you know a centralized lottery system for that. It's happening more at the community provider level. We don't collect data currently on young people who are not served in our programs. We, we know about young people who are served. Um, so I wouldn't be able to tell you how many people are turned away. Um, we do have some information on that. In instances where uh, providers are, ve are very over-enrolled, we would see that in our system. We would see, for example, if you had 100 seats but you were um, But you were uh, serving, you know, 120. We would see that demand is is exceeding your contracted seats, and we do make those adjustments from from time to time. Um, uh, could you just hold on for a moment? Do we need to make an adjustment? I think we're getting um, a communication from. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I won't go any further. <laughs> 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 Test one, two. Test one, two. <laughs> Test one, two. I think I'm. I think I. I think I was done. We we collect data on the young people we do serve. We don't have data on young people who aren't served, but we do get feedback from providers where um, demand exceeds their funded seats, and whenever possible, we try to make those adjustments. Um, we are, as you mentioned, in development of a new system, so it's possible we could consider um, additional data like that in the future. Um. Do you find that um, some of the seats um, and the slots that we have available are not filled? Overwhelmingly, the seats in um, Compass programs are filled, if not exceeded. But there are programs that struggle with enrollment. And part of our job is to work closely with providers who aren't filling seats to find out um, if they need some support with outreach techniques or um, if there ultimately needs to be a reassignment of those seats to another provider in the, in the ultimate circumstance. We try to avoid that whenever possible. We find um, that more support is needed with the community center-based programs than in the school-based programs. Of course, the young people are on site in schools and it's a very easy transition. The community center programs are very important for y some young people but it also requires more effort on the provider to get er, to get young people to their space. Um, are you referring also to the NYCHA, the Cornerstone program? Um, I'm referring only to Compass right now. I'm not really okay. speaking to Cornerstone or okay. um, Beacon programs, but that would be, and, and they, over, they, they meet their, their um, 
their service requirements, but I, it, it is an additional challenge mm -hmm. wherever young people need to get transport or are finding their way there. It's an added um, responsibility of the provider to ensure a smooth transition. Um, have you heard that um, some of the, one of the challenges might be um, the fact that it's difficult for them to adequately program um, for young people because of the late budget process? Um, you know, for example, some have shared that they only have a month or so to hire and train needed staff based on funding, uh, you know, allotments due to the budget, you know, passing in June and their programs commencing in July? Overwhelmingly, our program marks our baseline programs, and we have um, long-term contracts. Typically, it's a three-year contract with a three-year renewal. And a provider under those circumstances would be, you know, aware of the commitment to funding for um, into the next year. It wouldn't be a year-to-year -year basis. We do have a handful of programs, city council-funded programs, and others that are one-year funded. Um, that is a challenge that our providers have consistently met. That's a very small portion of our overall portfolio where providers have um, a long-term commitment from GYCD. We heard overwhelmingly during the budget process that um, uh, Summersonic was um, experienced difficulty meeting their numbers, not because the need wasn't there, but because of the late um, notification, um, it was difficult, you know, in terms of planning. Um, how can we improve, you know, the timing so that um, there are no slots that go unfilled and that the service providers are not met with the challenge of finding out late in the season that, um, that their slots are available? Whenever there are year-to-year -year budgeted programs, it's more challenging for providers than a long-term baseline program. But what we have seen, you know, overwhelmingly is that providers um, are, have connections with young people. They, they know how to find young people quickly to enroll in programs and that um, the overwhelming majority of seats have been, have been filled. Is there any um, conversations being had about baselining um, these programs? As you well know, there's so much conversation about Sonic Summer Services, and it's always been part of the budget process, and we look forward to that process in, to begin in early 2019, yes. Okay, so we, we know that that's on the radar and that we're looking forward to an early response. We look forward to having <coughs> that worked out in the budget process. Can you tell me how you determine the per participant price? Uh, for Compass. Um, Compass, the, the biggest expansion in after school programs in this administration has been the Sonic middle school programs. And uh, I think there was, you know, just prior to, I came on board a couple months into the administration, but I know there was a very robust um, budgeting process discussion with providers around cost per participants and um, we have varying rates depending on what service level you're working on. So um, I'm sorry, what was your question about what the uh, I, I want to know how you determine what that per participant price is. Um, we, we would, we develop sample budgets, we communicate with providers, um, there's a process, bet you know, between um, with GYCD and again and our providers and OMB about what's appropriate spending levels for each program area. It's um, has that um, has that amount um, varied? Has there been any increases to it? Um, have you you know looked at it? And how frequently do you look at what that that rate should be? That process typically happens through an RFP. Um, as all the elements of a model are considered, price would definitely be one that we would take into consideration, and um, that has happened with the Compass programs as well. So you have a new RFP that's out now for we SYEP, Compass, or Sonic, or all three? There is, there is currently no Compass RFP that is active. Um, the city did release an RFP for Compass in the spring, 
which we subsequently canceled because there were questions raised about the model and to the point you just answered, we do like to engage in discussions with the providers and that's what we intend to do. And okay, then, uh, uh, the SYEP? The SYEP RFP shall be out in a few weeks. In a few weeks. And has there been any conversation about a change in the rate? And if so, was there an increase, a decrease, what? So when we began this process two years ago, back in, in 2016, I think it was important for folks um, in the administration as well as DYCD to really understand the needs of the providers, right? What resources do you need to really implement what we're asking you to do? We engage um, providers in a number of focus groups. We actually engage young people to get feedback and comment from them as well. We work very closely with um, OMB to do what we call a model budget um, to see exactly exactly um, whether or not we're funding providers at the level that they need to be funded. So all of those exercises took place over the past two years. Um, and yes, the price per participant is definitely under consideration um, for the new RFP to increase. Um, <laughs> is, the, um, is the funding for SYEP, Compass, NYC, and Sonic, is that a reimbursable? Is that a reimbursable? program, the funding? I'm, I'm sorry, can you repeat Is me? the funding for Compass, SYEP, and Sonic, is, are, are they reimbursed, is it reimbursable? Yes, for SYEP. It's yeah. reimbursable. Yes, and for Sonic, correct, yeah. So um, a lapse in, I, I guess, notification and budget could um, also impact uh, their ability to deliver the services in a timely manner? I've gotten, let, let, let me restate that. I've gotten um, complaints from providers who have not been able to make payroll because of, you know, the lapse in, or the flow of funds and that it's, it's reimbursable. Have you had these conversations? Is there anything that you're looking at um, where you know staff works the, the whole summer and there's no pay for them? Well, we, we definitely listen to provider concerns. Mm -hmm. We are very, we take it very seriously when a provider communicates that they're having issues with payroll. And there are a few steps that we can take. The contracts, all DYCD contracts, I believe, are, are reimbursable. Uh, however, at certain stages in the contract development, mm -hmm. you can, um, I I is for example, at registration, you can be, you can request and be administered in advance um, on your contract, which you would be able to use to make those payments until you've had a chance to submit your your reimbursed um, expenses. In some instances, uh, providers have asked for a loan because they're not able to make it to to registration and they have some planning to do and mm -hmm. at a certain stage in the development of the contract, we welcome those loans and we work with the mayor's office of contracts to, to kind of help, pri help them prioritize mm -hmm. who's most in need and payroll would be a big red flag that we would do our best to <coughs> assist with. Okay, and all of the providers are aware that there are sort of these options or safety nets I think so. Mm -hmm. We certainly respond whenever a, a concern about, we encourage providers to bring mm -hmm. issues to our concern. I've had providers sometimes say, you know, I don't want to be a bother, and I think m the entire DYCD staff agrees 100%. The earlier you bring concerns to our attention, the more we're able to help you. Um, I think they are, I think providers are aware of those um, mechanisms. Okay, and um, how does the, um, administration collaborate with the nonprofits on program design for those three programs and um, did you consult with them the nonprofits on the rates when you put out the RFP and um, when DYCD extended the deadline for Compass NYC and Sonic so there's two different questions so do you consult with them, you know, when you talk about the rates? I will say there is 
more Before consultation with providers than than ever in the, under this administration there's been more consultation um, with providers than I think has ever happened before on rates on the um, compass RFP that we released and is no longer active um, we really didn't make significant changes to the model and in those circumstances we don't typically issue a concept paper um, and then I think the result you know the result of that is that questions were raised and we have decided as a city that we want to take time to consider those questions um, so um, you know I appreciate that that you know um, their concerns were heard and um, you're looking at that in terms of how you're going to reshape the RFP um, do you have a timeline for when you um, plan to get you know get to the conclusion and and issue the RFP I'm, I'm not aware that we've set a timeline I know that we're committed to working through the questions however long that takes mm -hmm. we have begun the immediate next step of extending contract tra contracts for current providers at least through the summer to <coughs> ensure that no matter when that is released we won't have any disruption to services to young people I have a lot more questions for you, but um, out of respect for my colleague, um, Margaret Chen has some questions. And we've been joined by Council Member Brannon. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to follow up some of the questions that you were asking. So last year, we had SYEP, 70,000 slots were baseline. So that funding is secure. Right? And then we offer 75,000 um, slots. I mean, there were 75,000 kids who participated in the SYEP program. So my question is relating to your RFP. So are you, is this RFP is gonna be totally new or are there gonna be provider who's gonna continue and you're just focusing on some of the new component, like the younger 14, 15 year old, like I just don't want to <laughs> envision that you're doing a new RFP and everything is gonna start all over again. I, I assume that's not what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, just, just give you some context, right? So back in 2016, as I mentioned in my testimony, there was a task force that was convened, right? And the idea was to look at our SYEP in its current, current form and to make tweaks to the current model. Um, under that task force, there were a number of recommendations, right? That was then actually developed to, by, to use those recommendations to develop the concept paper, right? Which I'm, I'm sure you guys uh, have seen. Um, and some of those recommendations was really around how do you connect school year learning with the summer opportunity, right? Making sure that providers understand what it means to develop um, sector-based jobs for young people. Um, there's also a recommendation around carving out slots for young people who um, are who lives in um, high poverty areas, right, and have special needs, um, very similar to the work that we do now with our vulnerable youth um, population. So keeping that in mind, all of those program elements were then used to inform the RFP. So yes, it will be a brand new RFP. We're calling it SYP 3.0. Um, we're very um, excited about it. Um, there's been a lot of work done over the past two years to gather um, feedback from providers, from young people, from advocates. We've looked at research to make sure that we're developing models that young people are really gonna benefit, benefit from. And current providers can apply for the new RFP once it goes out. Okay, so, so then what is your timeline? Because, I mean, like the provider that's been um, doing a great job, uh, experience, um, they, I'm sure they're gonna apply um, and hopefully they'll, they'll get awarded. But I assume from your testimony, you were talking about um, that you're also looking for um, new, new providers, additional providers, right? Absolutely. And at the same time, don't forget that in the city council, we are gonna be continuing to advocate for increasing SYEP. So we're not looking at 75,000 slots, all right? Just to give you early warning, because um, we've been advocating for universal SYEP. So 
for every kid, every young person that apply, we want to make sure they have that opportunity. Uh, so that's out there for quite a few years already, right? So I just want to make sure that in terms of timeline, that there is going to be sufficient time for providers to gear up Abs for the summer. I'm sorry. Uh, so. Absolutely. So we, we take. Um, so can you just explain us sure. like RFP? Absolutely. When are you going to be able to uh, award the RFP so that there's still going to be sufficient time for the provider to really get yes. ready? Absolutely. Um, so we, we take timelines very seriously um, at DYC. We want to make sure that providers have the time and the resources necessary to implement the programs that we're asking them to do. The RFP should be out in the, in the next few weeks. Um, once the RFP is out, then we go through um, a number of processes, right? So there's a pre-proposal conference where folks would come to DYCD and we sort of talk about the model. They could field questions, we answer those questions. Then typically after the RFP, is release um, the timeline in four to five weeks after that is the deadline. Once it's the deadline, then folks at DYCD go through the evaluation process to make awards, um, and that should be done sometime in um, late fall, maybe sometime in December. Um, and we expect contracts and awards to be made sometime by the end of December, early January. Well, I guess we'll hear from the providers later to see if that is sufficient. Um, I, I just, I mean, just what's so important that a lot of the provider who's already in your portfolio, I mean, has been working very hard to cultivate uh, you know, jobs with, um, you know, private sector or whatever to create some really unique opportunity. And I just want to make sure they don't lose those contacts that they, it's a continuation process. And how long is the the contract for? Three years or? It's, it's three years with the option to renew for an, for an additional three years. Okay, so right now you have providers that you are extending their contract? Um, their contracts are actually expiring. Uh -huh. So as of March 31st, 2019, those contracts are no longer in effect. Okay, so if they w were the one that were able to... So if they apply for a new um, contract with a new RFP, they will be awarded a contract sometime in January. So they would have no gap if, if No they, gap in service, exactly, to, to do, do their work. Yeah, exactly. So are you working very hard to sort of like work with the existing provider that are doing a great job to make sure that they are ready and going to be successful? Everyone has an opportunity to apply to the RFP. As you know, it's a fair and transparent process. Um, every provider has to be reevaluated for a contract. Um, and um, a lot of them in this room have demonstrated that they, they could actually do the work. And I encourage them to apply again and see what happens. But I think you also, I mean, part of your RFP, you do have to look at track records, right? Absolutely. OK. I just want to make sure that that's. And my other question is on. Compass and Sonic. Um, I know that you know everybody was you know smiling and uh, with the budget process. I don't think we want to do that budget dance. Um, let's put it out there, right? Summer, son I mean the summer Compass, summer school, summer program should be part of the regular program, all right? I don't know why DYCD don't see that. And the administration don't see that. And every time at the end we put in, it's a one-year program. It doesn't make sense. It needs to be all year round. Um, we have that with the, the, the middle school Sonic program. You know, we have a summer program component. And the summer program, I mean, the, the whole middle school program has been great. I've gotten a lot of very, very positive feedback from parents and from kids in middle school. And I think that is something that um, the mayor should be very proud of and continue. But we also need to make sure that there are after school programs for every single kid who go to our elementary school. There are a lot of kids who are not in those programs. There's not enough of those. I mean, from your testimony, why are you talking about only 50,000 uh, or 50, yeah, 56,000 um, elementary school kids? that are enrolled in 52,000. Um, 
that are enrolled in after school program. We have to really do more on that part. And I know that there are a lot of different programs um, in the school and they're not funded by DYCD. So does DYCD track those programs to or work with Department of Education to see how many after school programs are available uh, for the student? Unfortunately, most of those other programs are fee-based. And parents, you know, even like low-income parents, if they don't, if they don't have a, an after-school program for their kids, they have to pay, and that's a hardship. So does it, do ICD collect any of that information to find out what's the need out there in terms of providing after-school program for every single elementary school kids? Uh, we do track the elementary school youth that we serve in our own programs, of course, in Compass. We also serve elementary students in our Cornerstone and Beacon community centers. We don't track programs that we don't fund, but um, DOE has their own, also that would be city funded, no cost programs. I know um, 21st Century is, a, is a, an empire or both um, sources of funding for after school programs um, through DOE. And I, I believe, um, I don't have the data, but I believe that the 21st Century programs added uh, seats for elementary school students in a, in a recent RFP turnaround. Um, we don't monitor that, but our portfolio for elementary youth is just a portion of the city's overall commitment to elementary school youth in after school. Yeah, and the city needs to make a bigger commitment. I mean, that's what I'm getting at. And somebody should be tracking that. It's like, how do, I mean, it shouldn't be that difficult, uh, especially working with DOE. I see mayor's office people here. We want that information, all right? We want to know what's the need out there because anecdotally, we're hearing, you know, from parents, grandparents, that there is no option for their kids, right? And that should not be. So at least we could have, you know, better information in terms of advocating. I mean, across the board, you know, the, the mayor pushed for universal middle school after school program for middle school kids. That's great. We need to do that for the elementary school because there are parents who are struggling. They have to pay because they have to work. And that should not be. So, like, somebody needs to collect this data. If principals are offering after school program, you know, find out each school what their needs are. And then we can work together and fight for the budget to make sure every kid that needs an after school program gets it and needs a summer program gets it. That's what the council, we want to get to that point and we want to work with DYCD to get to that point. So I'm making a request to the mayor's office to get that information to the council. Collect all that data. All the agency, all, you know, DOE, come on. All that, you know, great programs out there, somebody should consult, you know, get the information together, okay? I am making that request so that we can have that information and we could be more informed when the budget, pro when the budget start, how much we should advocate for. We'll take that back. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I just want to follow up with um, Ch um, Council Member Chin's um, line of thinking um, that I wrote down while she was talking, data. You know, what data um, are you using to, um, to draft your RFP um, to determine what the PPP will be? Um, what data are you, are you using and, you know, what, what's the source of it for your RFP for Compass and Sonic? Yeah, I, like I said, we, we do sample, it, when any RFP is coming up, we do sample budgeting to estimate the average cost of a program. We look at spending of historic rates of programs. Um, this year, the city has made, um, or not this year, this administration really has made significant investment in the nonprofit field, including um, including a, a amendments to contracts that we've made, additional budget um, amendments that we've made to contracts to account for things like cost of living. And, um, and so all of that goes into consideration for what the 
price per participant is going to be in an RFP. And so there's definitely going to be an RFP for Sonic and Compass? Of course. We have um, the RFP that we released in May was actually, we've had many, we have many RFPs for Compass in mm -hmm. different years. You know, in the, in the launch of the massive expansion for middle school, we had a big RFP in the beginning for 2014. We did more RFPs for 2015 and 16 and 17. We continued to build on, the, on that success and, you know, help support provider capacity as, as the, as the uh, after school um, services continue to grow, grow, grow. Um, and what is the duration of the RFP? What's the period? Typically, it's a, typically we do three-year contracts with a three-year renewal. The, um, what I was going to say is, as you're aware, there was an RFP release. That, that RFP was for contracts that had been issued in the previous administration. And um, so it was a portion of the of the Compass and Sonic contracts that we needed to refresh. It had been um, several years. And is uh, Summer Sonic a part of this RFP? Which RFP? Yeah, the RFP that you're contemplating, you know, the one releasing. That the one that we released and um, and will re-release at some point in the future uh, includes summer services for elementary and middle school students. Yes. Okay, but you didn't say summer Sonic. So no, it does. Does it that it mean that there's going to be a different iteration? There are. There are many middle school Sonic programs that do have summer baselined into their contracts, and mm -hmm. we may, you know, we have every intention to continue those baseline summer programs. In any summer, we have approximately seventy thousand young people who are getting summer services as part of DYCD contracts. So I know you talk about expansion programs that have been discussed year to year, but I think it's important to know that there are elementary and middle and um, and high through our community center programs that have baseline summer services, and we are always committed to making sure those are high quality, robust services. So the contracts for Summer Sonic that were in place will remain in place um, until the new RFP Absolutely, we are committed to no disruption in services. We, we're not planning any changes to existing services in that way. Okay. Um, did you have? Okay. I still have a lot of more questions. Okay. But Council Member Brennan. Thank you, Chair. Um, I had a, some constituents asking me about the SYEP and um, the pr the change, the, the proposed change um, to the CBO part of the program that would be moved to a, a classroom setting. Um, w could you tell me what the wisdom is behind that? Absolutely. Um, so I've been doing this for, for over 10 years, um, running youth employment programs, and I was the SYP director for five years, so semi employment director. And um, what we have noticed, particularly with um, the younger youth, young, young people ages 14 and 15, they're, they're typically not work ready, right? They're, they're not ready to be placed with an employer. So when we were thinking about this model, we started to look at national best practices in terms of how other, how other states are actually serving this population. We also look at the research to see exactly what are the best practices out there for this age group. Um, and also having conversation with the experts who are the providers on the ground to determine what makes sense for this age group. And what we determined and what came out of those conversations is that you really need a project-based learning experience for a young person ages 14 and 15. So they could develop the skills necessary um, when you place them on an employer. Um, typically what we hear from employer when a young person is 14 years old, it feels like that they're babysitting them and there's not much they could do actually in the office. Um, and if they're not prepared at 14, why not take this opportunity to actually create a robust curriculum, really figuring out what are some of the things or some of the skills, or we like to say soft skills, right? But I like to say essential skills that we want to see them develop. So once those skills are developed and they get to age 16, they'll be better prepared to work in a workplace setting. Um, if you look nationally, in Chicago, they're launching a model for younger youth as well, um, ages 14 and 15, and it's very similar to what you'll be seeing 
in the RFP. If you look in Seattle, there's a model for younger youth ages 14 and 15. So we're definitely moving in the right direction. And I think young people absolutely benefit from the, cl the classroom hands-on experience. They would definitely develop the skills that we want to see them develop. And they'll be more prepared when they're actually placed with an employer and actually have a more meaningful summer job experience. Next year will be the, f uh, actually we have done some pilots. We've done some pilots over the past two years to test this model, right? We wanna make sure that providers understand and it makes sense for providers, we wanna make sure that young people respond positively to this new model. And based on the key findings, um, we had an evaluation done by MDRC when we rolled out a number of pilots two years ago um, and the, the findings were pretty positive in terms of moving forward with this model. Sixteen. It's called work-based learning, so it's project-based hands-on experience, and it's going to be sector-focused. Um, and I could use an example. Two years ago, we worked with um, a vulnerable youth provider who's actually in the room, um, LaGuardia Community College, to serve young people who are runaway homeless in the foster care system or juvenile justice. And we brought in a, what we like to call a content specialist group called the LAMP, right? And the focus is really on IT and web design. And these young people over six weeks were actually engaged in hands-on project. How do you build a website, right? And they also, also came up with a theme that was important to them. So there was a service learning element, right? And they did pres presentation at the end of the summer. But what did they develop? Teamwork, how do you communicate, right? And also the tech part of it, how do you build a website? What are the skills that you need? Um, so those are some of the things that we're thinking about. And as you think about jobs of the future for young people, you have to think about young people being nimble, young people developing skills around critical thinking, problem solving, transferable skills. So those are the sort of elements that you're gonna be see, that you're gonna see built into the RFP for this age group. I think once the program is implemented right, um, and, and again, I think it's important to, it's gonna be project-based opportunity learning, right? And we know young people are very techie. Um, so it's gonna be up to DYCD, and we're working on this as we speak, to create a curriculum that's engaging and that's interesting. Um, I think once we bring the right partners in and we create projects for these young people that will keep them engaged, it doesn't feel like they're actually sitting in the classroom for the summer, but they're actually developing, whether it's an app or they're developing a website or they're learning about the stock market, right? So we want to make sure that it's very hands-on, it's very engaging. I think young people are definitely um, be interested in attending those sessions. And again, as I mentioned, based on the pilots, young people showed up, they enjoyed it, they learned a lot, and they had a good summer. What was the um, <laughs> difference between, uh, <laughs> let's start all over again. <laughs> what was the, um, what's the difference between the stipend and the salary? That's um, under consideration now, as you know, the RFP has not been, been released, but um, we'll be more than happy to share that information once the RFP goes out. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, is, uh, to uh, um, continue along uh, Councilman Brennan's line of thinking, um, how much money would this program cost, and um, is it an increase or decrease to the amount to provide this this part of the program? Again, we're we're still looking at various pieces, um, and we're more than happy to share with you what the final budget amount will be once the RFP is released. Mm -hmm. What is the percentage of 14, 15 year olds um, out of the, you know, the overall? So uh, there's a 30%, 30, 70% split. So 30% of our population is younger youth, 70% is older youth. And, and that's, that's the targeted number? Does that number fluctuate? Is that? It, it fluctuates a little bit, but not very much. Um, for example, last summer, the number was 72% older youth, 28% younger youth. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, everybody seems to be obsessed with SYEP. I'm not any different. Um, but um, 
you know, last year with um, the preliminary budget showed that there would be a noticeable drop in the projected slot to SYP, but, you know, through much advocacy, we were able to get them, and the funding was provided, although um, not on target with the goal that we planned. You know, how can we ensure that SYP is funded properly and that all the youth that have the opportunity to be a part of this program you know, will be employed during the summer months. I think we have made incredible progress over the past couple of years. Um, when this last RFP was released, we actually awarded 23,000 slots. Mm -hmm. um, and thanks to many folks I see in this room or some of the providers on the ground, we were able to serve 75,000 young people um, this summer. Um, we're the administration is committed to making sure that we provide a robust summer job opportunity for young people when they want to work. We're going to work with our providers to make sure that means the resources to implement this program. Um, and uh, again, I'm just amazed every year how the providers are able to pull this off, and they continue to amaze me and do good work. As Council Member Chin said, you know we're going to be totally advocating for more slots. Um, and so Council Member Williams asked me to ask you um, what you've done to increase the infrastructure to handle more slots. Absolutely. So we're releasing RFP, as we all know, um, in, in the next few weeks. Um, and the intent of the RFP is to be a little bit more specialized in terms of making sure that providers are able to provide services based on their strengths, right? Um, as a result of that, I think what we will see will be able to attract more groups that, has not that have not necessarily applied to SYP or to be in the portfolio. Um, so I think we'll see some growth there in terms of the number of groups that we have on the ground pr and providing jobs for young people. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're really looking at our database system to make some tweaks to that, to make sure that our providers have it as easy as possible on the ground when it comes on to collecting documents, um, facilitating the workshops. So those are some of the things that we're definitely looking, looking at, and some of those recommendations from the task force we're taking very seriously while we implement the program for next summer. Are we expanding our base in terms of like looking in the private sector, um, different industries? Right, uh, so one of the recommendations was really around how do you develop a program that, it, that has a sector Nope. I'm sorry. No, no worries. And all this time, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to. <laughs> I'm going to turn it off. Okay. Okay. So maybe. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry. No, no, no problem. Um, sector, um, a sector-based focus. And what that simple means, as you know, New York City, a few years ago, released the Career Pathways Report. And in that report, it, it outlines six sectors that the city really wants to focus on, not only for youth, but for adults as well. Um, what we're gonna be encouraging our providers to do is to develop jobs and experiences and projects within those six sectors. And of course, we have some providers who are typically very creative, who think outside of the box, that might want to explore some other area that's not covered within the six sectors that we're going to sort of prescribe for the RFP. Um, one of the things that we want to work and focus on is around um, technical assistance, around employer engagement, right? It's a culture shift. When you talk about developing more jobs in the private sector, you have to make sure that providers have the skills necessary to have conversation with private employers. It's a very different game when you're walking into your local community, into your mom and pop lawyer's office or doctor's office and say, listen, I want you to employ a young person opposed to reaching out to Bank of America and saying, I want you to employ this kid, right? So how do you sell the program? How do you make sure that the value add for that organization is understood? So those are some of the things that we're gonna be teaching through capacity building, through TA. Um, and I think what we'll see as a result of this work maybe not next year, but in the next few years, you see the type of work experiences being a little bit more substantial um, over the next few years but because of those investments. But while you're preparing them, you're not gonna give them the option to have like hands-on experience? Are you referring to the young people or? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
as I said before, if you're 14, 15, you're going to be engaged in project-based learning opportunities. If you're 16 and so older... So you're going to prepare the 14, 15-year-olds to go into private sector No, jobs? no, no. Uh, um, uh, potentially, when they get to 16, right, if, mm -hmm. they, if they've gone through the training, we, we think they're work ready, they have the skills necessary to perform well. If you apply to SYP at 16 and you express to the provider have an interest in tech and they have developed some amazing tech experiences, why not? You should be given the opportunity as a kid to be placed in, in, in that. So I'm, I'm trying to understand you. You're saying that you have to train staff on how to develop Absolutely. jobs in the private sector? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Employee engagement. There's some special technique. Okay. I, I will talk, I'll talk, yeah, them? absolutely. I'll talk to you about what, I, so there's employer engagement and then there's job development. These are two different things in the workforce space. Job development, you basically go in, you have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone, they say, yes, I'm gonna give a job for a kid for six weeks. Mm -hmm. It stops there. Employer engagement is a constant conversation with the employer. You're engaging them from before the internship starts, during the internship, after the internship, you're getting a lot more feedback about the intern experience. What do you want to see? What are the skills that you need as an employer that you want to see these young people bring to the table, right? Um, do we have providers who do that now? Yes, but these are larger providers' resources uh, with the resources to be able to train their staff. What I'm, what I'm saying, do I see these gonna develop a robust TA plan so all the providers in the portfolio will be trained on how to engage private sector employers? So are you hiring more people, more staff to do this? No, so I'll use an example. A few years ago when our, our commissioner started, Commissioner Bray Chung, one of his goals was to increase the number of private sector jobs in SYP. Um, back in 2014, I think, hopefully I have the date right, we had 28% of our jobs in the private sector. It was Commissioner Chung's um, dream, which he achieved, to get it up to 45 to 50%. But before we're able to get to that point, we work with a TA capacity building provider in the city that's called the Workforce Professional Training Institute. And our providers went through a series of training on how to engage providers. As a result of that, we were able to offer that to every other provider. And that's how we we're able to grow the number from 28% to 45% because of the training that they received. Okay, so you are now training sort of the trainers. Right, so it would be the, maybe the program directors that would be trained this. and they're the frontline staff that would be doing the job development may, or they might bring on a job developer to do that. That would be trained as well. So how does this um, fall in line with our goals to provide more jobs? I, I think it's not necessarily about it providing more jobs but also about the quality. Are we on the same sort of like timeline? Yes. To, to make this happen? Yes, it's these contracts are gonna be in place by early next year. Um, we have a contract with a number of vendors. Um, we are gonna be having conversations as we speak about what that training should look like. Um, I, again, I think the big takeaway from this should be around more meaningful, more substantial um, experiences for young people. And in order to give them that, you have to train the folks who is delivering the services. So um, this is a budget question again. Um, the PPP, the um, participant price um, for the different models of SYEP. Can you tell me um, what they are for younger youth, leaders, ladders for leaders, vulnerable youth, cure violence, and youth with disabilities? Sure. Um, for younger youth and older youth, the PPP is currently three twenty-five, so three hundred twenty-five dollars per kid. For the vulnerable youth option, the PPP is $600 per kid, and for ladders for leaders, $1,000 per participant. And um, cure violence in youth with disabilities? Um, cure violence is $325 per participant, mm. okay. um, and youth with disability varies from $325 up to $475. Okay. Um, ladders for leaders, um, this program, this program takes, uh, I guess, the higher functioning um, students. Is this a sort of an elitist program? Absolutely it's not. <laughs> okay. um, ladders, as you know, I will say this. This program is really the gate opener for a lot of young people in New York City 
whose mommy and daddy and uncle and sister and brother might not have a connection at Goldman Sachs or mm -hmm. Chase, right? Um, and all we well, view this. That's an awful lot of us. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, I know. How many kids are in this program? Um, this summer, we served roughly over 1,500 young people in ladders. Um, I, again, if you look at what we require, you know, you could have a B average. You know, you have to submit an essay and, and a transcript and go through 30 hours of pre-employment training. Um, if you meet those minimum requirements, which is typically lower than the typical um, competitive programs that you'll see in the city, um, most of our young people have gone through the training. They have done well. They have excelled. We have great partners in our ladders, Portfolio, a and &E, Bank of America, um, the Met. I could go on and on. Is there an academic requirement? There is. You yeah. need to a B average. A B average. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, why such a broad disparity between the PPPs um, for, say, younger youth or vulnerable youth? You know, we're just a, yeah. this is a thousand dollars per participant, right. and cure violence is three twenty-five. Right. It, what are they getting for that? It's about the level of engagement on mm -hmm. two fronts, on the employer engagement, job development side, and also the engagement on the participant side. For ladders for leaders, once you're accepted, you have to go through 30 hours of pre-employment training mm -hmm. with the provider. And, and that looks very different for different providers, right? So you're learning how to write your resume, how to write a cover letter, how do you interview, how do you prepare for an interview. Um, and the provider is then responsible for developing the job, which is employer paid. Mm -hmm. So DYC, or the city is not paying for this job. And that takes a whole lot of time and a whole lot of energy to get employers to say yes. Um, on, the, on the younger youth side, on the older youth side, it's 325 per kid. Again, the job development roles are a little bit different, and those young people are only going through eight hours of um, orientation. So again, there's a level of engagement in terms of number of hours that you put mm -hmm. it in for both the employer engagement piece and the participant piece. Okay. Well, we've been joined by Council Member Deutsch. Um, do you have any questions? Oh, they've already asked their questions. So, if you would like, I'll, okay, okay. Um, in terms of uh, Compass, NYC, and Sonic, uh, the general funding, um, how much money is designated for each Compass, NYC model, including Sonic? Um, sure, just give me a second, if you will. For mm -hmm. um, Compass total, uh, fiscal year 19, 335 million. Um, I'm going to give you a breakdown of that if you give me a second. Uh, um, I have the numbers from Adopt, which don't include um, some of them, but for elementary in Adopt, it was 138 million. For middle, 185 million. For high, 2.3 million. And for Compass Explore, 2.2 million. Okay. Um, the funding for Compass and Sonic um, increased um, for fiscal year 18 to 19, yet the number of participant slots were projected to decrease from 126,000 to a targeted 110,000 over the same period. Um, can you explain how increased funding leads to fewer participant slots for OST programs? There, there, there definitely has been no reduction in service or in projected numbers of youth served. On um, the chart that you provided, um, the fiscal year numbers from 17 and 18 mm -hmm. are the actual youth served in, that, in those years. Uh -huh. So that's not just the funded seats that we provide, but it's the overall numbers of young people. Um, the target for fiscal year 19 is 110, um, although I see no reason why we would see any fewer numbers of young people served in fiscal year 19 as fiscal year 18. 
Some of the variations on that is explained, especially in the middle school program, because we know if we fund you for 100 seats that it's not typical for every one of those 100 middle school students to fill the whole seat to, s to come five days a week for three hours a day. Middle school, they're starting to engage in some other activities. Mm -hmm. In those cases, it's perfectly acceptable from DYCD's perspective to enroll, say, two kids in one seat. This kid is coming Monday and Thursday. This one is, you know, Tuesday. You get what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. um, so very often we see they're, s they're serving more than one person in a funded seat. Our projections currently are based on... Um, so it's like a duplicated head count? Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so that accounts for the difference that you're seeing. It's actual versus... Um, so we're not, fun, uh, we're not serving less young people no. and more money. Okay. Um, how did you um, sort of arrive at your target number for how many young people would be targeted for the program? are based on funded seats if I remember is it based on the PPP we the way DYCD funds compass programs uh -huh. which is different than the community okay. centers we fund specific seats so if you are a sonic provider serving a hundred young people the base allocation for you will be three thousand dollars per youth Okay. If you're going to serve more, you get more. If you're going to serve less, you get yet less. It's a par price per participant. Um, but I do know that we, recognizing that providers were serving more than their contracted seats, we did bump the, you know, the MMR targets mm -hmm. recently. I can't remember the details on that. I can get back to you. But it's not just funded seats. We have made adjustments seeing past actuals to increase that, that target number. Okay. Um, just uh, uh, SYEP, the school-based program, um, uh, what is the criteria you use um, for schools to participate, and how, how will the young people be selected for that? Sure. Um, so currently, um, we just completed um, the summer with over 4,000 young people mm -hmm. in the school-based model. The schools were, we worked very closely with DOE to determine what schools should be a part of this option. And DOE? Department of Education. What schools? In conjunction with DYCD. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, it's, you know, DOE is their schools. So you and know they provide what the sense. criteria was? Yes. Um, you have to be a community school okay. or a CTE school, um, have some sort of existing infrastructure or programming in place that will be able to support SYEP. Um, and, and ensuring that the principal wanted to be a part of this program and wanted to do it. Is there um, any um, plan to include more schools um, in the school-based program? Yes, th there are plans to include more schools. And does the principal have to sort of initiate that or... So I'll who work initiates out, right. what schools will Yeah, I, I'll apply. use the example from this summer. Um, mm -hmm. We released a list of 32 schools um, right. through a short application process. Um, once the list was released, providers then had to determine what schools they want to work with. Um, providers then approach various principals, mm -hmm. have a conversation around whether or not it's a good fit for them, right? Sort of like, not like an arranged marriage, but sort of like mm -hmm. one. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> And then once the provider and the principal determines that this could be a good potential relationship, the provider then apply to the short application with that principal. And once the provider is given an award, that's the school that they work in. Okay. Um, I just, uh, you ready? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. I'm never ready. <laughs> I just came back from uh, my district and uh, I've been yelling at city agencies. That's why I sound <laughs> like this. Um, but I, I just want to get to, um, firstly, I just want to say that uh, I don't know if you um, actually monitor how many SYEPs that go to elected officials throughout the city, but I could tell you that um, I have about 60 SYEPs um, during the summer. I don't say no to anyone. Uh, we have enough work, thank God, for, unfortunately, for every single um, youth that comes to my office, and as well as during the winter months, 
Um, I have a, also I have um, young adults that volunteer every single day in my office. Matter of fact, I just came back from meeting with uh, the Kingsborough um, College president. His new president just came in, so one of my interns came with me, and she was a student from Kingsborough, so she was very excited. And uh, she's going to be joining us here in City Hall, and we have on a rotating basis of different um, um, different volunteers and interns that come into City Hall. So it's really it's a great experience. And another uh, SYEP volunteer uh, actually just got a written up in uh, one of the colleges, uh, Turo College, and they just tweeted at me this morning. So I'm proud of her as well. Um, I just want to talk about how. Um, you're switching gears of uh, the programming for some youth employment program to an ed educational uh, type of um, program for our youth, uh, for, for specifically for 14, 15 year olds. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, it, it's not an educational program. Um, it's really in workforce in the workforce space, particularly working with young people. The new terminology is really called work-based learning opportunities. Um, and what that simply means, you're trying to make sure that young people are having an, a classroom experience and also placing them on projects, right? So how we envision this, young people are gonna be learning, the, the provider, and I think I'm, I'm using an example so you could kind of understand where I'm going with this. The provider might decide that the, the sector that they wanna focus on is technology, right? Once a provider determines that, the provider then is gonna be able to craft six weeks of activities around that specific sector. The provider have the ability to bring in a content group that has experience working with this population. So for example, it could be um, coding, right? It could be learning how to develop w websites. Young people are gonna be learning those skills. So they're not necessarily sitting in a classroom where someone's gonna be talking at them. It's very hands-on. Um, and then throughout the six weeks, they're gonna be developing their own projects. And the beautiful thing about this, this model is that young people will work in conjunction with the provider to determine what is it that's important to you. If you're gonna build a website, do you wanna engage your community and have some sort of community engagement plan once you leave SYP around getting more park space, right? So again, I just wanna be clear, it's, it's not gonna be a model where young people are sitting in a classroom and somebody's speaking at them. They're gonna be engaged, working together, building these skills that are important for them once they leave SYP that they could absolutely utilize. Do you have a uh, program that you currently have or a pilot that you can invite council members to and elected officials to actually come observe before you implement this program? And first of all, when are you planning to implement it? Uh, next summer. <laughs> so, so my question is, this is the first time I'm hearing about it. Um, I don't know if you spoke about it before. I, I did. Um, um, I, I know that there was another program before that failed. Um, I don't know how successful it was, the Work, Learn, and, and Grow program. That wasn't that ex successful, uh, to what I'm told. But I, I would like to know that before something gets implemented, um, that we make sure it works. You know, I just had an initiative in the city council to provide... Um, Halal food, right? So that's a pilot program. Um, I have several other pilot programs that I'm doing because sometimes you have to make sure that it works properly before you implement it. But if we're jumping in and in, in the next summer season, and, and I'm a big ad, I'm a strong advocate because I have so many teenagers and so many success stories of young adults that go through my office and they end up being successful going. Uh, to great colleges, and I watch them grow and graduate, and, and watch them move on. And in addition to that, um, I, my office, myself, we try to find them jobs. Right. So once they come through my office, um, we set up a resume for them. And uh, matter of fact, one of my interns just got a job a few weeks ago uh, with a great organization. So th these are some of the things that really are meaningful to me. Mm -hmm. So before we have some type of change in the programming, uh, being hands-on and having these uh, young adults in my office, uh, I wanna make sure that before we um, take a program and change it to something that uh, we don't know about, we wanna make sure that it's gonna work properly. So um, what do you have? Uh, sure. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, 
as I mentioned before, this process started two years ago um, through the task force um, that was convened by the council and the administration. Um, a number of recommendations came out of those task force, and before we actually released the RFP, we thought it was important to test some of these concepts. Uh, last summer, summer 17, we actually tested a model for younger youth um, engaged in project-based learning opportunities. We have done our research, right? We, we made sure that we look across the country to make sure that there are programs that exist, to make sure that we're seeing impact from those programs, programs that have been evaluated. Uh, use an example before you came in, um, council member in Chicago, they have a very similar program for younger youth ages 14 and 15. In Seattle, there, there's another program. So this is, the, it's a new trend um, based on what we're seeing on the ground as workforce practitioners. We're recognizing that young people ages 14 and 15, they're just not ready for the workplace. And they need to, it's about skills um, development and acquisition and we recognize that we need to equip them with those skills before we actually place them on an employer. So this has been going on for two years. We have engaged providers, a lot who are here today, about whether or not this makes sense and what they would like to see um, on, on the ground. And as I mentioned before, I was SYP director myself, and when I would allocate slots to providers, you know, there are a few of them that would struggle to fill the younger youth slots because employers would not want to employ them because they felt like they were babysitting um, and the young people just weren't work ready. So we had to really look at all the data that we had. We had to look at what's going on nationally. We had to consult the folks or the experts develop, um, implementing the program. And based on all of those different factors, we, we feel strongly that that's the best direction to move in. So how many children, how many children do you believe will go through this program? Um, so right now, we serve 75,000 young people, and there's a 70-30% split between our younger youth population and our older youth population. The idea for, again, the idea, because we're still working through the RFP, is to apply that same split and percentage split between the younger youth and older youth population moving forward as well. All right. Um, I, I, I tend to disagree. I mean, you did your research. I just tend to disagree before we jump into something um, because I, I have 14, 15 year olds in my office and they've been really uh, hands on. Um, I'm just giving you my opinion. I'm not, you're doing great work, okay? For the record, if Mayor, if you're watching, they're doing great work. <laughs> but I just tend to disagree. I have, I have five children of my own, I have two grandkids, oh, wow. and um, if the people, the people here, if you can't find a job or workplace for your children, feel free to send them to my office, okay? Okay, it's like a boot camp. <laughs> Call me, Call me. 718-368-9176. You send them to my office, 2401 Avenue U, okay? I will take any child in. You're all welcome to send. So if, 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 no one should have a problem sending their children into the workforce, okay? Everyone should be accepted. I have a very diverse group. They all get along, and they're a team. They're number one, and uh, we love them all. So I just want to make sure that before we move forward with this um, new program, that we're able to see firsthand how it works, and even speaking to the children and the parents. So if we could just, like, take a step back uh, and I'm going to push this very hard, speaking to m many of my providers. Um, I have some of the best providers in my district. As a matter of fact, uh, Council of Jewish Organizations of Flatbush, is, I think, is one of the largest. And um, they've been very successful. And uh, they've been really hands-on and really great. Is, uh, the program direct is really unbelievable. And we get so many people coming in from all five boroughs. Uh, really diverse group. And so I'm telling you, go see Kojo, and, we'll, and you'll see how quick you're going to get a uh, job placement for your kids or your grandkids. So I just want to uh, say for the record that uh, I'm not here to complain. I'm willing and to work with you, to partner with you, to make sure this works. We have advocates in the district that could sit down with you and work with you. We want to make sure that this, um, our children, our future, um, gets the best that they deserve. Um, and just starting something new and jumping into it, um, I think we should start very small and not 
um, you know, according to the split that you mentioned, because that's a large number, that's a high number, because if it fails, then we're failing, we're failing a lot of children. But if we start off small and we see how it works and we see how we need to tweak a, a plan in the program, uh, then, then, then we could go into success, something successful. Council so I'd like member, to see something small, can yes. You, can you wrap up? Yeah, I'm gonna wrap up. Thank you. I think my 15 minutes are up. Okay. And she only gave me a few extra minutes because I'm not feeling that well. But um, I'd like to have a further conversation with you if you could get me your contact information and we'll work together. Thank you very much. And finally, I just want to thank, I'm sure she's going to let me say this, I want to thank our chair for doing a phenomenal, outstanding job here in the city council. Thank you. Thank you. You can have 20 more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll start right now. <laughs> Um, you know, we have a lot of people who want to um, testify, and so I'm going to do kind of like lightning round. You know, I just have a couple of things that I just need to um, to clear up. But along Councilmember Deutsch's line of thinking, um, uh, I, I think when you look at um, the 14 and 15 year olds, and you're talking about giving them a stipend as opposed to a salary, you know, what is what is that difference? What, you know, um, financially um, in numbers, what what's the difference? And there's such a, a broad range from $50 to $700 for the stipend. How are you gonna determine who gets what and everything? There seems to be some things that I think still needs to be either fleshed out or you need to make it very clear to us what it is that, you know, it is. But the, the difference between a salary and the difference between a stipend could, um, could really make a difference for, you know, a 14-year-old or 15-year-old um, in terms of their summer experience. Yeah, so. I, I understand. Okay, all right. Um, work, learn, grow. Um, is it is it true that you are um, talking about um, eliminating this program, and um, and why is it being targeted for elimination, um, and what will the impact be to the participants? Like, how many young people are we talking about being impacted, and uh, and will all of the work learn funding be rolled into SYEP? Um, Talk to us quickly about yeah, Work, Learn, Grow. Um, as, as I mentioned before, we just launched Work, Learn, and Grow last week. Um, we have over 4,000 young people working across all five boroughs. Um, what is exciting about the new RFP, um, and I, I can't go into much details, but there are going to be program elements where you're going to see a lot of year-round employment opportunities for young people. That are very are you eliminating work, learn, grow, as as it exists today? As you know, work, learn, and grow is funded as an, on an annual basis. Um, mm -hmm. It's not baseline, and I think that's something that we could address um, during the budget process. Okay, um, <laughs> council members. Did, okay. We will more than gladly, you know, do that. Um, so, so I don't know if that's uh, we're eliminating it and we're remodeling, we're retooling it and just rolling it into SYEP. Are we? Is is that a reasonable assumption to make? Again, the RFP will definitely have elements. Okay, um, and is this the same RFP that we're talking about for Sonic and Compass? No, no. this is the So SYP. it's a different one, and what is the timeline for this RFP? It's the same RFP that I've been talking about, the SYP RFP that we're releasing in a few weeks. In a few weeks. Okay, so it means that you already looked at it, you have it planned, if it's gonna be released in a few weeks, <coughs> you can't tell the city council what is what's being proposed? Again, what's exciting about this RFP is that there will be elements from work, learn, and grow. Um, it's gonna be a lot more young people getting engaged in year-round activities. 
Um, but you can't work. answer my question, yes or no, whether it's being eliminated. Work, learn, grow, as we know it today, is being eliminated. Again, work, learn, and grow okay. is a part. It's always I'm been a part of the- trying to get you on the record. Okay. Um, Cornerstone and the community centers. Um, the mayor's management report um, said that the youth served in the Cornerstone community centers um, in, in the NYCHA facilities has decreased from fiscal year 17 um, from 27,012 participants to in fiscal year 20,856. Um, there was also a reduction in the same program from the on the adult side from fiscal year 17 to fiscal year 18. Can you talk to us about the decreases? Um, are there fewer providers then, or did community centers close? Um, youth served in cornerstone programs and adults served in cornerstone programs on the MMR, right? There is, um, there is a reduction in both, and we are looking into whether, I mean, th those are the numbers for the MMR, but we also have ha had some transitions going on with our data system, and we are looking at our providers and whether that's like an actual reduction in numbers or it is part of what is reported in the data. Um, are you talking about some sort of technical glitch in the data reporting? Are you talking about the reporting mechanism or we How? we trans we are transitioning to an amazing new system. It's like a multi-year project at DYCD. We've already implemented many elements of it, which is the evaluation part of program monitoring. And this fiscal year will be the first for Cornerstone and Beacon and Compass programs of like a full year of reporting participants into our new database. In fiscal year 18, we began in one database this summer and we finished the year in a different database and we are concerned about whether that transition actually lost, whether for providers that was burdensome enough that we lost some data entry and I think we'll see, what we anticipate is we'll see um, more stable mm -hmm. data in this year, our first full, full year and even more as years go by and they're they're more familiar with the system. They become experts the way they, um, the way they will be. But there was there was no decline in the number of providers that were providing the services. During no, no the decline year. in providers. No decline in funding, um, which is why we think. And it's probably none of the community centers closed. Um, no what? more than are usual by, you know, a situation you have a fire or you have something going on and you have to. Um, temporarily close or relocate, no more than usual. That's good. Yeah. So you're saying you don't think there is an actual decrease that it might be lost just in the transition of We're not going to report technology. more numbers to you or to the mayor than we actually have documentation for, but we do suspect there may be some lo some element of that in the num in the change there. And we the, the I think the important point is we still far exceeded the number of contracted people to be served, both youth and adults. We, which is why you won't see like in some other elements where you're not meeting targets, so there's more detailed ex explanation. Um, for Cornerstone, it was 144% of at target. So we know that the programs are robustly attended and that we're meeting our targets. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank you for your patience and I want to thank you, the, the folks who are here, for your patience. Um, and we will now call the next panel. Thank you again. Um, I expect that information. I want to know those timelines for those RFPs. And I do want an answer about work, learn, grow. Um, oh. And someone is going to stay behind to hear the testimony, yes? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Is this one or the same? No, it's this one because he. Okay. 
Okay. All right. The next panel will be Fred Watts from the Police Athletic League, Dove Oster Nightshare. I'm from Kojo. I'm sorry if I. Okay, what council member Deutsch said? No. <laughs> Rabbi Ostasha. Dove Ostasha. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Lewis, is this Webb or Welts? Welts? Welts, okay. And Faith Benham. They him. UJA. He's very helpful. You you said he would be. It's very helpful. Well, Take it. I've been nominated to start, and I understand I have two minutes. I will uh, try to. Oh be yes, <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. Where's that clock? <laughs> Thank you. I will try to be as efficient I'll as possible. Him, I'll give him my 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, my name is Fred Watts, and I'm the executive director of the Police Athletic League. Um, we are grateful for the opportunity to speak here today. I'm here with Marcel Braithwaite, who is our uh, director of community engagement and has been very active in his career on the program side as well. Um, we are very grateful for the support from City Council and, um, and for the funding from DYCD for uh, the various programs that we run. Um, the, the nature of the comments are sort of the gaps between perfection and where we are, so I don't want this to sound like a complaint session, but I did want to point out um, some of those gaps, many of which have been covered uh, uh, due to the uh, quite astute questioning from the council members, many of these gaps have been uh, sort of covered, so I'll just kind of enforce them. Um, and I'm just gonna focus on the areas as they were presented to us. So in the SYEP program, um, our organization has been able to employ roughly 1,200 to 1,500 youth in a given summer, which is fantastic. Um, we see sort of two issues we would um, love to address. One is in the sort of operation of the program throughout the summer, we're seeking more consistent information. So in other words, sometimes we are asked to do something in Queens, but we're asked to do something different in the Bronx. And so any consistency in sort of how we are to operate, paperwork, things like that would be great. And um, there seems to be a reluctance to put those, that um, guidance in writing. It would be much easier for us, juggling 1,500 uh, young people to have sort of written guidance. Um, the key that you have harped on um, throughout many of the questioning is how early we get guidance, funding, and so forth. And we find ourselves often in positions where very late in the you know, spring into the early summer, we're told that we want you to fill another 100 slots. Or we want you to, and so anything to communicate with us earlier so that we can de deliver a quality experience would be really important. Um, in the Compass and Sonic area, our feeling um, is, is boiled down to a couple of things. The minimum requirements for performance on our programs seems to be require more funding than we are given. So here we go. I, I, I think what everyone has to say is of value. Um, I think two minutes is really a little short. I'll give you another minute okay. and that everyone will be afforded three minutes and now the second over, okay. <laughs> so um, just some more transparency about the gap between the funding from the city and what we have to come up with otherwise would be very helpful. Um, and also the evaluation process. We welcome the notion that we need to be evaluated and held accountable, but the flavor of the evaluation process often seems feels punitive. So anything where it can be more collaborative. Funding. Uh, and contract management, again, 
earlier, earlier amendments, earlier contract registration um, it would be really important. In the RFP process, we seek what everybody seeks, more opportunities for feedback so that the programs can be developed uh, well. And in terms of expansion, um, our experience is greater investment, higher uh, investment per child is better than expanding numbers, especially when often they come, the, the, the information comes later. So that's our quick um, synopsis. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, Chairperson Rose and members of the Committee on Youth Services. My name is Faith Bayham, and I'm an advocacy and policy advisor at UGA Federation of New York. Um, UGA's network of nonprofit partners oversee a number of DYCD funded youth focused programs, including SYEP, Compass, and Sonic programs. Uh, we're also an active member of the Campaign for Children. Uh, we recognize the support the City Council has provided to all the DYCD programs in the past and really hope to maintain that support as we begin the fiscal 2020 budget Are you speaking into your mic? Could Sorry. you push Get it closer, closer to you? Okay. <laughs> um, so on behalf of UJA, our network of nonprofit partners and those we serve, we just I thank you for the opportunity to, te to testify today. I'm just going to provide a few highlights. Um, I have many pages of testimony that I'm going to provide you after I'm done. Um, so we're grateful that the city, after hearing the concerns surrounding the inadequate rates and the Compass and Sonic RFPs from nonprofit providers, um, decided to cancel those RFPs. Um, one of our nonprofit partners told me very early on that they decided not to apply for the initial Compass RFP when it first was released. Um, saying simply that we just can't run a program we are proud of based on the proposed reimbursement rates. Um, some of the suggestions below I'm going to provide for improving both the Compass and Sonic rates include increasing rates for Compass after school programs so that every slot is funded at the same amount, um, fully implementing indirect rates and cost of living adjustments, um, and when I say fully implementing those rates, I don't mean one standardized rate given to every provider because as we know, cost of living is different for every provider in every part of the city, um, including costs associated with paying staff increased minimum wage. Um, this itself was a huge stressor for many of our nonprofit providers trying to decide how to figure that out with no additional funds. Um, and also including funding for the new labor requirement that minimum salary be increased for exempt staff from overtime regulations. Um, we have a lot of our directors of after school programs who work overtime. So that's going to be a stress on budgets. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about the SYP RFPs. Um, so all of our nonprofit providers are anxiously awaiting those RFPs to be released. Um, something that we would like to see once they are released is an increase in the price per participant. Um, younger youth and older youth providers have been compensated at a rate of $325 per participant since the 2008 RFP. We'd like to see an increase in that. Um, we'd also like to see some more flexibility for providers. Um, we're really excited about the special initiatives RFP and um, DYCD looking to serve individuals with disabilities more through the SYEP program. Um, but in the concept paper it said that there is a one staff per 25 individuals with disabilities um, proposed for younger youth with disabilities. Um, and we look at it as every youth with disabilities requires different supports and providers should be granted with some flexibility in the staff to participant ratio. I'm gonna finish because the last part, I have a feeling the gentlemen over here are going to be talking about project-based um, issues. So, <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> They're done. They're, that's she's, another. she's leaving it up to me. Yeah, that's a different argument. <laughs> Thank you so much. Let's see how this is gonna work. I'm going to be very brief. Hi, my name is Louis Wells. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Kojo Flatbush. Uh, thank you, Councilman Deutsch, for giving us a shout out, but he did most of the work for us. I'll be very, very brief. I want to I want to thank you for the, um, for the information you shared with our office. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, but that's the, uh, there are a bunch of, it, of items that we would like to discuss, but I really want to hone in on that item itself. Um, I'm, a, I'm a bit taken aback that Andre White left. He and I have a very good rapport, but there's something that I would be delighted to debate with him. Um, and most people who are participants here would, uh, will tell you that the WLG program eliminated the 14 and 15 year old uh, children because we did project-based for them 
and it mere just failed. Um, kids don't want to be in classrooms any more than they have to be. And I know it's, we can put a nice spin and say it's not educational based, it's preparing them for the future, but at the end of the day, we are taking a job, cutting their salary by more than half, and we're calling it a stipend, okay? And we're basically saying, um, so we're, we're, ga we're taking away every incentive for them to participate. Incentive number one is the money we're taking away. Incentive number two is we're putting them back into the classroom. I will leave my 37 year experienced gentleman, Dovo Stature, by the way, no rabbi, <laughs> uh, that's okay, um, who has run this program prior to me joining Kojo and um, perhaps will be longer than I will be at Kojo. Uh, he has more experience with that and I want him to talk about this, but that's what I wanted to hone in on. Thank you very much for the opportunity and thank you, Chaim, for the shout out. Dovo Stature, SYP director. I, I have comment on many of the uh, details of the, uh, of the concept paper. I, I think to make a point, though, I'm going to single the one that I think would be most disastrous if it comes out the way it is. The concept paper did a good thing. It brought out ways to serve previously underserved groups of people, and that deserves all kinds of compliments. But in the numbers that are being discussed, there are 18 to 20,000 younger youth being discussed. And while the concept of work-based learning, uh, we've done it before with Ave and Pave with some of the other directors and things of that nature, will work for certain small groups, the city does not have 800, 900 Pied Pipers, and you need a Pied Piper to keep a group of 20, 25 youth during the summer in, the, in, in functioning as a group. The city doesn't have the 900 Pied Pipers, the 900 rooms for them, and the 900 cohesive groups that will get together. So while it will work in a small group, and maybe it should be part of one of the new options, it's silly to throw 18, 20,000 youth from a path which has worked for dozens of years I worked with the Youth Bureau, with the Department of Edu uh, with the Employment before DYCD. Children thrive by taking a break from what they do regularly. They go back to school encouraged by the fact that they earned money, that they were given responsibility. Uh, they even get up earlier in the morning. <laughs> they are different people if they have a job and if they take home a wage, even the same dollars certainly not a quarter of the amount of money or so, because the plan as it was uh, uh, given, if, if a youth starts late, they'll get 350 or $500 for the summer. If they do the whole summer, they're gonna get 700. We don't know what'll happen if they miss an hour or two in the plan as laid out in the concept paper. It's a nice idea, but we have to fasten our safety belts and land the plane. There are 18,000, 20,000 youth we're talking about and jobs are healthy for the youth. Thank you. Um, I totally agree. Um, so what would be a good number from, uh, for this pilot? Uh, I would like to see them pilot the program before they take, you know, massive numbers of young people. Um, uh, and put them back in a classroom environment. I come so as an educator. Mm -hmm. There are, we're dealing with the youth as if they're monolithic. There are, uh, there is a percentage, maybe it's 7%, 8% of youth who want to study all day long and they'll really do well. We have one group which uh, the city came to visit called Mind Weaver that had 14 and 15 year olds that were doing programming, all kinds of stuff like that. And that was part of a job. They were being paid, they were doing work in addition to learning this. Uh, for some youth, it's good. Some youth need the break. Mm -hmm. I don't know if what we really need is a pilot or two separate programs, <coughs> one for those who, I, I would call it a lattice for leaders type of program for the 14 and 15 year olds. And we, n we mm -hmm. could use a, that mm -hmm. kind of a program. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe the city should try it at 2,000 youth or 3,000 youth if they see it's working great and they need to add next year some more, fine. If it's not, do what they did with WLG. But they don't belong throwing 18, 20,000 youth 
into thank an unproven you. item. Thank you so much. And thank you for echoing, you know, our concerns about um, how long it takes for them to let um, the providers know that the funding is coming. Um, and uh, we're on the same page in terms of um, the number of young people that they are now um, removing from um, experiential learning to, you know, back to a classroom situation. And um, I am very concerned about the difference between the stipend and the salary. It really will make a difference for a number of young people. So that's something that we're going to follow up. I'm going to follow up with it as a as well community as chair. Absolutely. Earning a, earning a wage is absolutely. Is dignity and knowledge that they are capable of. Yes. Earning a salary is taking a hand, a stipend is taking a handout. Absolutely. I totally agree. I want to thank you all for your testimony today. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ajoa? Zifa? Uh, oh, just Zifa. Okay. Um, LaGuardia Community College. Um, Laura P. James, SYEP, WLGEP. Research Foundation, Research Foundation of Megar Evers College, Michelle Jackson, Human Services Council, and Robert Clark, El Barrio's Operation Fight Back, Inc. And um, when you get there, you can identify yourself and you can begin your testimony. And you have three minutes. Good afternoon, Thank my you. name is Ajua Gifa, and I'm the Thank director for the Workforce Education Center, LaGuardia Community College, SYEP, Work, Learn and Grow, Intern and Earn, Justice Community, <laughs> name it, all the youth programs. So Thank my you. testimony today is to say that um, I've been doing SYEP at LaGuardia Community College for the past 25 years. I have seen the program grow uh, exponentially over the years. We started out with 125 young people um, in 19, I think 1989. To date, we have served this year we served 3,800 young people. Huge program. I don't have a problem, I have a problem with the stipend. I don't agree with paying the participants a stipend. I think that they all should be paid a wage. Um, the 14 and 15 year olds who come through my program now, everybody in the room is different. I am at a college. I have a different way and a different means of being able to service my young people. We did 17 work-based service learning projects this summer, 17. So that was 25 young people in each one of those classrooms. They were not in the classroom all day. This is not about them being in a classroom. The work-based projects are things that they want to do and they go out in the community to do them. So they do get some classroom facilitation but then they go out into the community to do their work. So they're not sitting in a classroom, at least not in my program. I can only speak for LaGuardia at this point. For our older youth, um, it, it's a very difficult sometimes, and I think Andre was trying to make the point that there is a difference between um, engaging employers and trying to find a job for a young person and actively being a partner in a partnership with employers to maintain that relationship over a period of time, which is what we do very well at LaGuardia because we do have, the, again, the intern and earn program as well. Um, and so we have active participation with partnerships with employers instead of just saying, okay, we're just gonna find a job and give it to this young person for the summer. It's about the continuity. I'll go back to some years ago. There was a time years ago when SYEP had a after program um, component where we actually had to have contact with those young people at the end of the program. That was some years ago and then some, that went away, all right? But SYEP is important to our community, but the objective is to make sure that every young person works. And we can't always guarantee that because they have other issues. They have school, they have, but we also develop 
our program around those folks who have school, so we try to make sure that we have after afternoon hours as well, so that those young people who are in school in the morning can come to us in the afternoon. We can stay open late. Some people can't. You know, if you have a building where you have to be out by five, what do you do? Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Laura P. James, and I am the director for the Summer Youth Employment Program at uh, Medgar Evers College Research Foundation on behalf of Medgar Evers College. Also the director for the Work, Learn, and Grow uh, Employment Program and the director for the school-based pilot program at uh, 2018 out of Automotive High School. I, I just love what I do as a summer youth employment program and at Medgar Evers College, we do get the support, not, from, uh, not only from the, the staff, but uh, just about everyone uh, there is ready to help. Uh, as a community-based program, I work with so many other um, uh, uh, en entities, you know, private, uh, over young people go to the MTA, they go to s the Supreme Court. I tell them that I'm in the subway station, I'm at the schools, I'm at the, wherever uh, people get together to let them know that we have great young men and women looking for a meaningful place to work. And so we started uh, with 50 about uh, 14 years ago and this summer we had 900, including the 100 from the automotive high school. Uh, success with the, uh, with the school base, the automotive high schools. We have four of our participants who are now uh, registered at Medgar Evers College as freshmen, and that is so successful. Um, we want this program to continue. We need uh, more than 325. We can't do it uh, in order to keep staff. We need to have more than $325. Uh, five hundred dollars even but we need more uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to be a part of today's My name is Michelle Jackson. I'm the Deputy Executive Director for the Human Services Council. We're a membership organization of about 170 human service. Oh, is it not on? It is on. Am I just not close enough? Oh, I have to get very close. Okay. <laughs> so we represent about 170 human services providers in New York City, and we really focus on the institutions themselves. Um, you'll hear, and I already have heard from people who are delivering that program um, out in the these programs out in the community. Um, I want to thank you so much for holding this hearing and drawing attention to, to these issues. Uh, we really are concerned about the DYCD Compass and Sonic RFPs. When they first came out, we have what's called an RFP rater, where we rate RFPs for risk. And we rated these two RFPs. Um, we want to let nonprofits kind of know how risky some of these contracts are when they take them on. Uh, and these were two of the contracts that we, or RFPs that we rated the highest in terms of being risk. Um, the biggest one being the funding mechanism. Um, as DYCD testified earlier, the city administration has made investments with the council support, which we thank you for, in cost of living adjustments and indirect funding. And these RFPs came out with reductions in those areas. So they're basically don't take into account that there have been increases in workforce salaries and indirect costs. Um, and with the help of our partners at UNH, we found out that a quick survey of our of the, some of these providers, there was about a thousand dollar gap in some of these services between what it costs and what actually, <laughs> and what the, the RFP specified in terms of rates. And so that's really concerning. We brought those uh, to the attention of DYCD and MOX and thank, and we really appreciate that they took the time to pull back those RFPs and engage in a dialogue. And we hope to see the RFP improved. Um, and we think this is a systemic issue. We think you know, there's a real opportunity here with RFPs to fix some of the systemic funding issues that predate most administrations, right? This is 40, 50 years in the making. Um, but we'd really like to see, DYCD mentioned that they do sample budgets. We'd love to see those sample budgets included in the <laughs> RFP um, to see how their math, um, and, and you know, goes against what our providers are saying really costs. Um, and so that would be a helpful mechanism, like what did they think is a competitive salary versus what's a real competitive salary? Um, what are they putting price participant versus what it actually costs? Um, 
And that also speaks to the collaboration. Um, I think DYCD did en engage in some collaboration. The Nonprofit Resiliency Committee has put out um, a guide to collaborative communications with providers that we'd like to see more heavily used to do real surveys. Um, we did one with our partners at UNH after the fact, but we would like to see groups like DYCD do that before the RFP to see how much it really costs, what outcomes are they actually meeting, and build an RFP based on what um, the needs are really in the community and what the programs really look like, especially when it comes to cost. And I think when we see the RFP come out, plenty of providers will still bid on it, even if it doesn't cover the cost. And it's not because they just complain and then a bid anyway. <laughs> it's because they're mission-driven organizations and they don't wanna see those programs leave their community and they know they can deliver those quality services, but they're on such razor thin margins that you're going to see organizations either have to turn those back at some point or uh, go under, like some of the organizations we've seen in previous years. So we appreciate that they pulled them back and hope there'll be some real improvements in future years. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> All right, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Robert Clark. I'm the Youth Services Coordinator at El Barrio's Operation Fight Back. And I'm just here to mention some things about the SYP RFP. That's what I specialize in. Um, basically, one of the main programs I oversee is the SYP program. And I would like to say from, I started out about four years ago, and it has been nothing but growth from year to year and within four years. So people that has been doing this plus for 25 plus years, like I can just see the growth within four years in terms of whether it's been implementing new financial literacy programs for the youth, whether it be, um, f yeah, one thing they've really been focused on is financial literacy and like I really commend that because my, my establishment, my um, organization is located in East Harlem, which is the most, is one of the most academically and economically oppressed <laughs> communities within New York City. So like with the help of DYCD and being able to go through this program through SYP, um, a lot of the incentives that they provide for the youth has been very beneficial. However, so with the upcoming RFP, one thing that's really like standing out to me is the younger youth contract is because one, the stipend base will honestly be no good. I'll, I know a lot of 14 and 15 year olds that will be heavily affected by that outcome. Uh, there's no reason why they should be, there are already workshops implemented in the younger youth uh, contract. So to take, to take out the working aspect completely is not really providing any growth within the younger youth. Uh, also, they, they, they spoke about more techno technologically based um, programs for the youth. However, that's another cost for providers to be able to provide that technology and provide the proper staffing that's educated enough to uh, give that information to the youth so that way they can carry it on with them su successfully through life. Um, also, um, they did mention with the WLG program it did fail with the 14 and 15 year olds um, because there was no there was no proper outline or guide for providers to use in order for them to succeed and properly continue on with. All right, I just want to talk about some other stuff. I know my time running out. So I know you mentioned the council mentioned something about universal universal um, slots available for all everybody that applies. The, I, I Yes, I'm a youth advocate. I would love for that to happen, but realistically, that is challenging because there's so many things that comes about. There was 160 participants that applied and 120,000 was selected. However, there was only 75,000 that applied. So that leaves a gap of 45,000 participants that did not, that actually were selected but couldn't work due to various reasons, whether it be going back to school, whether they got a full-time job that they actually wanted or something else. So it just leaves a more problem on providers going, reaching out to for additional slots and they can't actually, they, they ruin relationships with work sites that they actually go out and develop if they can't place a youth there because of a youth lost interest in the program. So Universal will be great I love the concept, 
but it's not realistic because of that aspect. Thank you so much. Well, um, the way I, I view Universal is that a job would be available for any young person who wanted it. So, you know, those who sort of uh, self, you know, select or, or, or decide not to participate, they wouldn't have to, you know, but for those who wanted to, that the jobs would be available. I want to thank you all. Um, your testimony was um, elucidating. Um, I'm going to ask them, you know, who, who saw those sample budgets? Thank you so much for, for bringing that up, you know. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask them about that. And um, thank you. Um, we're going to continue to fight, you know, uh, the, for the wage versus a stipend and, um, and looking at the PPP. Um, so thank you and um, the, the, develop, the need for developed services. So I thank you all. And I just want to ask, um, who's still here from DYCD? Okay, thank you. All right. Next panel. Lady Avila, Queens Community House. Jackie Bravo or Brave? YMCA? Joanna Dela from Mishulu Montefiore Community Center? Mashulo Community Center. Brian Lakata, UAU. I know that name. <laughs> Diane Arweiler from Hannock Youth Services. Okay. Um, you can, as soon as you're seated, you can identify yourself in your agency and you can begin your testimony. Please speak into the mic. Good you afternoon. Have three minutes. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lady Avila. I'm the Deputy Director of Youth Development Centers for Queens Community House, and I'm here on behalf to express our concerns, and we do thank you for the time that you are providing for this. The first one, and the sentiment is echoed throughout the whole, throughout all of us, um, the disparate Funding levels, so within DYCD, there's two different funding levels for elementary programs. Some of them are funded at $28,000 and some of them are funded at 3,200, excuse me. Um, so with the new RFP that was proposed and pulled back, uh, the increase was supposed to be slightly higher. However, however, currently the contracts that are still in existence, we do have some contracts at 2,800 per participant, which is below the 3,200 that some or majority of our compass programs are at. So the concern is the disparity in the funding level, which creates a barrier for us as providers to really create programs that we are proud of, but actually are impactful to our students and participants in our community. So our agency, Queens Community House, we serve as the Borough of Queens. And so our mission is to enrich the lives and strengthen and build healthy, strong communities that are inclusive. And so we question and we ask how are we able to do this when the funding is not appropriate according to what the needs are. The other concern is the increase in minimum wage. So the increase is going to happen come January 1st. And so we are all preparing for it in our budgets. And so again, the question, those budgets that are only reimbursed at 2,800 per participant are going to become even tighter. And yet we're still being held to the same strict guidelines of DYCD. We're still being held to the strict regulations of OCFS DOH. As we are all aware, we still need to maintain the ratio for the participants that we currently service. The other concern is also the salaries. <laughs> so in this field, we work countless hours, and we all know that. But as the Department of Labor has increased the threshold for overtime exemptions for to be at 58,500, 
we also ask, has this been considered, will this be considered for the new upcoming RFP proposal? If not, then the question again begs, how do we provide quality programming? And how do we retain qualified staff in order to provide those high programs, high quality, impactful programs within our communities? Um, a few other concerns. Sonic summer programs. Oh, I guess my colleagues will pick it up because I know this is one concern. Uh, one big concern. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Uh, Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Chairperson Rosa, members of the City Council, thank you so much for having us today. Uh, my name is Johanna Dehler, and I'm here to testify on behalf of Marshallo Montefiore Community Center, which is one of the largest nonprofits in the Bronx, and we have been a provider of Compass, Sonic, and SYP, SYP programming for decades. Um, we have seven Compass and 11 Sonic programs, and our uh, SYP program has enrolled about 2,700 students this past summer. And uh, these services are in high demand. We have about 600 students that are on a waiting list for Sonic and Compass, and we have processed over 7,600 applications last summer. So today I want to address some of the issues with the Sonic uh, Compass and SYP RFPs, and I'm just focusing on a few key um, items here. There is more detail in our written testimony. First of all, as we all know, we share the need for a realistic cost per participant rate. Um, one of the biggest challenges, uh, challenges that we face are um, that we need budgets that reflect the actual program cost specifically when it comes to increased cost of living adjustments, uh, increased minimum wages and salary rates, and also increased indirect costs. And actually, <coughs> this has been a concern since some, some of our programs would be operating with a lower cost per participant rate under the new RFP or you know redacted RFP than we already have on some of our current contracts. So we would be offering services at a lower cost under you know, the proposed or previous RFP. Um, the second concern is actually the sustainability of the summer SONIC program. In, the, in four of the last five executive budgets, the mayor has not included the SONIC summer component. And um, while we're really very grateful to the City Council for restoring this funding on an annual basis, this is very challenging in terms of uh, logistics as we have to confirm the space, we have to hire staff, we have to um, finalize the curriculum. It's also very difficult for parents to plan their summer if they do not know uh, if their kids will have a slot or not. Finally, in regard to SYP, Cost per participant rates need to change. They are still the same since the 2008 RFP. We don't know whether that has been done. And finally, the big issue is the stipend versus uh, wage um, concern. And also that 14 and 15 year olds should have the opportunity to have a job and uh, you know the, uh, the opportunity to have actual employment and not just a stipend. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jacqueline Bravo with the um, McBurney YMCA. I'm part of the larger uh, YMCA Greater New York organization. Thank you very much for uh, letting us have the space to speak today um, and for always being you know, phenomenal community partners um, along with DYCD. Um, I w we have a written testimony, but I'm gonna try my best to summarize all of that in three minutes or what? Can you pull your mic a little closer to sorry. you? Clo closer. Yeah, sorry, it's harder for, I have a person in here. <laughs> <laughs> no, Pull I'm going to do the best Pull I can. <laughs> I'm going to be breathing. It's going to be great. Okay. No, thank you so much. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, we uh, operate about 70 Y after school programs across the five boroughs, a combination of Compass Sonic funded, fee based, and privately funded. Um, we uh, operate 
operating a Compass and Sonic program at this time has become difficult due to the increasing costs that we've talked about. A lot of my colleagues and, and yourselves have mentioned. Um, there's a cost of living, minimum wage, um, minimum salary exemption, and fringe benefits. Um, we've also mentioned the fact that there are those two tiers for um, those different cohorts. There's the 2800 and the 3200. Um, that is um, a challenge to be able to be able to provide the same level of quality at, in all of the communities that we're serving. Um, uh, but, and additionally, that the, the RFE didn't sort of um, align those two systems or expand to increase capacity. Um, this is something that we think the administration should consider. Um, also, the canceled RFP did not fund summer camp for all, and it's long established that summer learning engages youth physically and mentally and prevents summer learning loss and provides a safe learning environment for working parents to rely on. Um, we, al we also have programs that we are um, running. One program that I want to talk about, uh, PS33, it's in the Chelsea area. It is funded through City Council. Thank you very much for your commitment to youth, uh, youth and families in, in our communities. Um, this particular program is um, over over time we've uh, we've seen a lot of change in the community. Um, right now, the school is located feet away from uh, NYCHA housing development, the Chelsea projects. Also, short blocks from the High Line and the Hudson Yards development. Uh, because of the huge disparity in income, we <coughs> see the changing community and high um, uh, turnover of a lot of kids that are dealing with transitional housing. Um, so in the last three years, PS33 has gone from six families in transitional housing to 45. Um, this program is not a program that DYCD sees as uh, ha has been able to um, put on the list for funded sites. Um, we have done our best to fund that through city council and some other additional funding, but we've gone from 100 to 70 <coughs> slots in the last four years. Um, over 50% of the families we serve receive some public, some form of public assistance, SNAP, or live in NYCHA development, and um, we we think that. We need more funding. Um, <laughs> as, I'm an SYEP alumni. I, I'm, I, I just want to be clear about that. From LaGuardia. Um, and uh, yeah, also shout out to SYEP. It's in the testimony. <laughs> Councilwoman Rose, I'd like to thank you. All right. Councilman You're Chin. Welcome. Last year at the same exact time, maybe a little bit earlier in March, we came here and we spoke. I was enthusiastic uh, about what we spoke about. I am sad today. Um, not from you, but we're having the same exact conversation. Mm -hmm. Last year I prepared a testimony. When I was ready this year to prepare my testimony, it was the same testimony. <laughs> it is the same concept paper. It is the same RFP. Um, things have not changed. Uh, we have talked about investing in our youth, but we haven't. Uh, mm -hmm. What we've seen over the last year is that minimum wage has gone up, as my colleagues have pointed out, um, expenses have gone up, salaries have gone up. We can't afford to keep our own staff, and that means that we cannot serve the youth that we want to serve. And let's face it, we're all in this room because we actually care about youth. Mm -hmm. Okay, nobody went into this um, because they wanted to get rich. We work for charities. That's for sure. You know, <laughs> uh, I love what I do. For the last almost 15 years, I have listened to Ajua, I have listened to Dove, and I have taken advice from them, and I have learned what I'm trying to actually do with my youth. My program has drastically changed over the last 15 years, going way back to when you were at the College of Staten Island. <laughs> I'm proud of my program, but I cannot do this without funding. Mm -hmm. There is no way. When you look at these programs. Talking to the mic. I'm sorry. <coughs> when you look at these programs, we are not even serving 20% of high school and college age youth in New York City. That means we are just discarding 80% of the youth. Now we work with DYCD programs, we work with DOE programs, uh, we work together very well. Um, but the one thing that lacks is communication. Uh, we don't couple these programs. You know, we try to keep them isolated. Um, one of the things that we've seen over the last few years is that there is some duplication, and there shouldn't be. Uh, what we should be doing is leveraging our funds. We should be figuring out ways that we can actually get more youth served. And Councilwoman Rose, I know that this is something that you try to do and you've been bringing programs to Staten Island. Um, but Staten Island has actually seen uh, a lower level of people enrolled in college, a lower level of people enrolled in uh, employment sectors, um, a, a rise in violence, 
And a lot of this is due to that there are not job programs out there, training programs out there. Um, summer youth program, I know it's the summer youth program. It is not a six week program. I, I don't wanna hear people say that I work for six weeks. This is a year round program. <laughs> we put so much time and effort. We work with kids throughout the year. We take them on trips, we go to Albany, we go visit colleges. There's no money for this. You know, we get $325. I mean, $325 is like dinner, you know, out <laughs> one night. That is nothing. You know, we really need a bigger investment in these programs. And I just wanna let you know, I know I'm over time, there were a number of providers that were turned away downstairs and they wanted to speak. Some of them waited, some of them did get up here, but some of them had to leave. Why were they turned away? We didn't have enough seats. Oh, uh, but we have an overflow room. Before Don't the over... We, we, we didn't have overflow? Hmm? That was full as well. That was full as well. We asked everybody to email you their testimonies. I brought someone's testimony up here. Okay. Um, but they do want to speak. They made me turn my phone off. I was, uh, <laughs> I was transmitting uh, secret messages <laughs> to DYCD. <laughs> Hi, my name is Diane Arweiler, and I work with. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I work with Hannock Youth Services, where I'm the director of um, multiple youth programs that we have. We have Compass, we have Sonic, and we have SYP. We have Work Learn Grow, and we also participated in the school-based pilot program this year, which I must say had a lot of complications in it. Um, one of my biggest concerns is what everybody has said, and which I'm going to piggyback on is the rate per participant. 325 for SYAP is not going to be doable if you want to continue to have staff members that are going to be qualified for the amount of work that they're asking for. Um, if they want to do school-based learning, you're gonna need teachers. Teachers get paid at a pre-session rate of $45 an hour. I won't be able to pay them that if I'm getting paid 325 per participant. So how am I gonna be able to do the quality of work that they're asking us to do if we can't even pay the staff members that we need to pay them? Second point is, for instance, I have two Compass programs. Like everybody said, there's two tiers. I get one at the 2800, then I get one at the 3200. I have to run the programs the same way, but I'm paying my staff at one program a lesser rate than I'm paying the staff at the other program. People talk. It's not fair. Um, what am I supposed to say to them? Well, unfortunately, because one is getting funded by the council funding, I can't, and the other one got the RFP contract, this is what it is. It's either you're gonna do it or I'm going to have to find other people who will do it. That's a problem because now, mm -hmm. who am I gonna get to work with these kids? How am I gonna get them to stay on board? Summertime comes around. We need more staff. The ratios go up. We're taking them on trips, so now it's one to five. How am I gonna pay these people if I can't even afford them during the school year? Um, for instance, I'm only allotted 150 slots for the school year but I have in one school 565 students, and in the other school it has 794 students. They also have DOE programs where, okay, it's free. So where is the statistics on all of that stuff that we haven't seen yet? Um, work, Learn, Grow. I'm kind of surprised on how everybody's saying that it doesn't work, because Work, Learn, Grow piggybacks off of SYEP. Work, Learn, Grow is the way that we could continue the communication, uh, communication and partnerships with the work sites that we do have. You eliminate Work, Learn, Grow, how are we gonna continue that? It's not just six weeks. We need to have constant mm -hmm. communication with the work sites. Yeah. Without that constant communication and bonds and um, partnerships that we make with them, it's not gonna be a success. So they really need to look at things and if they're going to try to do it in the school base, mm -hmm. there's multiple hands in one pot. You're not only dealing with us, the contractor, you're dealing with the principal who doesn't know anything about SYEP, and then you're also dealing with the CBOs that they may have at the schools. So really gotta rethink things before that RFP goes out, and it's gotta give us enough time to make sure that we could set it up where it's gonna be successful. I know that your testimony is not falling on deaf ears. Um, it's something that we will continue to have the conversation with um, DYCD, and you know, and I thank you for your passion and your commitment. And um, and I'm sorry, I apologize to this last panel. You have been very patient. Um, thank you. Uh, you can um, you can be dismissed.
Um, and it is Gregory Brenda, United Neighborhood Houses. And you've been so helpful to us, Gregory, today um, in preparation for this hearing. Thank you so much. Nicole K. Jacob A. Reese, Neighborhood, House, Neighborhood Settlement. Alice Bufkin, Citizens Committee for Children. And David Slotnick, Samuel Field, Central Queens Y. And again, I apologize that it, it's been a long day for you but um, we wanted to hear everybody's testimony. Thank you. And you can identify yourself, your agency, and you can begin your testimony. Good afternoon. I'm Gregory Brender from United Neighborhood. Oh, sorry. Hi, I'm Gregory Brender from United Neighborhood Houses. Uh, thank you, Chair Rose, Council Member Chin, uh, not just for this great hearing, but uh, also for all the fighting you've been doing uh, for youth services, including next uh, Wednesday, October 17th at 3 p.m., uh, a rally to thank the mayor for including summer camp in the budget this year and to stress the importance of bringing it, um, making sure it's funded uh, before the budget process. Um, so we were very excited to, to, to work on that with you. Um, I have a lengthy testimony that I'm not going to read the entirety of. I'm going to start with just um, responding to some of the questions that kind of came up in the hearing. One was, um, Council Member Rose, you'd asked about the difference between a stipend and a, uh, a, a salary. And I think there's actually um, some more simple way to put it that um, essentially the stipend maximum in the concept paper was $700. Um, it would be this working the same number of hours, 15 hours a week for six weeks would be 1150 under the current minimum wage and 1350 under the $15 minimum wage in um, uh, 2019. Uh, so there really is that that difference, and in our um, in our response to the concept paper, we actually laid out some of the things that would need to be done if we were to move to a stipended system, like including a transportation subsidy, and making sure that they're paid weekly instead of biweekly, um, just to make sure that you know Princess's money could go right into kids' pockets. Um, also, I just wanted to talk a little on work, learn, and grow. I know it was. Oh, sorry. Maybe I was told it. Um, also on work, learn, and grow, I know we sort of talked about as a, as a failed program. I think that really just talks about the the project-based model for 14, 15 year olds. It's actually been a really successful model and it's something that we really want to see keep going. And it, it both is important because um, it really reinforces if you're talking about SYP teaching kids, like you have to show up on time, the kind of soft skills, having that go for the school year, having them combine that responsibility with responsibility of school is really powerful. And then just from a very practical perspective, having that program around year-round su supports year-round staff. It helps build the relationships that providers have with the, uh, with the contractors. So it's not just like they're coming in the end of the year to, or at the end of the school year to try and place kids, but they have an ongoing relationship. They've been doing site monitoring and all that kind of stuff. A um, couple other things just wanted to touch on. Um, the Sonic Compass RFPs, uh, we are grateful for the, to the administration for, for canceling these RFPs and extending the contracts. And we know they've talked about an engagement process on that. And we want to uh, see that engagement process be successful. Um, and I've laid out in the response that actually there were the same uh, things that Faith brought up, uh, some of the things that we need to see um, addressed uh, going forward. So the rest is in the written testimony. And thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Chair Rose. And can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chair Rose and Council Member Chin. Um, my name is Nicole Kay from Jacob A. Reese Neighborhood Settlement, located in um, Western Queens. I'm here on behalf of the youth families that we serve in the community at large. I echo all the sentiments around challenges today, specifically around the Compass and Sonic program rates, um, around the SYEP program, and I'm gonna specifically talk a little bit about the need for elementary increase slots. Currently, um, we have six of our locations which provide after school for elementary program, yet only four of them are actually funded by DYCD contracts, and all four of them have waiting lists. Waiting lists are often so large that we have to turn parents away from even turning in applications. Too often, this causes additional challenges for us. 
this includes parents needing to actually take off work so that they can actually just even turn in an application and then to be turned away that we can't even accept anymore, it's not acceptable. Um, some of our locations have lines so long that they wrap around buildings, hundreds of people waiting outside to present these. And that also causes challenges for the communities um, around safety, around traffic congestion, and so forth. Programs fill up so far and fast in advance that our parents that have challenges that come up last minute are not thought of in this process. So if you encounter parents who, for whatever reason, had to relocate or lost their child care that they had, they are then told, we don't even have a place to refer you to. So these are things that we're asking to be considered in this. Um, both of the schools that provide these um, Compass programs, they also have additional after schools programs that are in the schools. Sometimes they're fee for service, and we're still seeing these waiting lists on top of that. On top of that. The uh, two program locations that do not have DYCD Compass contracts um, are then further limited because we don't have those resources. So we're seeing fewer weeks of programming being provided no holidays, no summer camp, and potentially less slots. Both principals have requested for the increase in services, which we are unable to provide, and at least one other principal in another school has also asked for us to provide services, which we obviously can't provide either. Without the increased slots, many families will go without the ability to provide safe and quality care for their children. If these slots cannot be provided, then it is suggested that the city work with the providers and allow them flexibility to help serve as many families as possible. Just quickly, I want to just propose something that hasn't been stated, and that is working with the providers around the ability to transfer slots if they are multi-service providers, meaning that if they have more than one location, if they have the ability to transfer slots between their own sites for higher needs, it'll help alleviate some of these waiting lists. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Alice Bufkin. I am the Director of Policy for Child and Adolescent Health with Citizens Committee for Children of New York. We're also an active member of the Campaign for Children. Um, thank you, Chair Rose and members of the committee for, for holding this hearing today and for your ongoing commitment to youth services. Um, I do have testimony with more detailed um, recommendations, a lot of which echo what's been said today. Um, so I just want to touch on a couple of items. Um, first, we are certainly very grateful that the City Council's strong support for Sonic Summer, summer Programming um, helped fund 22,800 slots for middle school students this year. However, we know more work is needed to ensure that every middle school student enrolled in Sonic after school programs is able to, ask summer, is able to access summer programming. As you know, in four of the past five uh, executive budget proposals, the mayor has eliminated the summer camp component for at least 34,000 middle school students. We ask for the city council's continued support to ensure we have sufficient funding baseline to serve all middle school students in need of summer programming. Um, I'd also like to echo what Council Members Chen and Rose said earlier today and emphasize how important it is that that summer funding come through in the preliminary budget and not um, having it restored last minute. So as I know you're well aware, that puts enormous burden on families and on, on providers as we've heard today. Um, as part of my testimony, I have a report that we created in collaboration with the Campaign for Children that explores some of the issues that providers face when they have to sort of repeatedly face this potential cut year after year. Um, additionally, we ask that the city address enrollment priorities for students and shelters and prioritize their enrollment in after school and summer programs. After school and summer programming can be critical for homeless students who can benefit from social and academic supports that help to break down social isolation and promote academic success. Unfortunately, there are a number of barriers that prevent um, students and shelters from accessing these services. For example, children who are bused from school typically leave school uh, before those programs actually begin. Um, children who transfer schools mid-year often find programs already full by the time they come in. Um, and also summer programming currently gives priority to children in the after school program, meaning that if a uh, student and shelter is not participating in that after school program, they won't have priority for summer programming. So as the city continues to develop its after school and summer programming, uh, we urge the city council, DHS, and DYCD to consider the uni unique needs and vulnerabilities of, students and sh and of children and shelters. 
Um, and the last item uh, was spoken about very, um, you know, clearly in, in the, the testimony right before. Um, so I just want to, you know, reiterate that, um, you know, we do urge the city council's continued support to implement universal access to full year after school and summer programs for elementary school children. Um, your leadership this year allowed 9,000 additional elementary school students to participate in Compass. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, unfortunately, as you know, this funding was only for one year. So we believe it's important not only to maintain current levels, but to expand Compass elementary capacity so it can become a universal program. Um, so again, thank you very much for having this hearing today. So it sounds like I was last. Um, so I'm gonna be brief, you have my testimony, um, and I'm, I'm gonna just highlight some of the bullet points and things that my other colleagues have said. I wanna thank all of you, Chairman, Chairperson Rose and other members of the City Council for giving us this opportunity to talk today and meet with you. Um, my name is David Slotnick and I direct youth services and education services for the Samuel Field in Central Queens Y, located in, in Queens. Um, I, I was mainly here to talk about the Compass and Sonic programs, um, which we have um, eight Compass, six Sonics, and also three Beacons. But I do wanna iterate that we also have SYP and Work, Learn, Grow. So we probably um, see over 3,000 uh, youth uh, during the uh, year in those programs. Um, we, it's funny, we mentioned earlier outcomes, and one of the things that DYCD really focuses on for outcomes is rate of participation. Um, but we really were looking for more funding in the next RFP to include additional funding for students so they can participate in things like um, educational enhancement, uh, activities outside of the building, trips to cultural institutions, um, to, to work with them in developing their positive youth development, social emotional learning, um, and develop a, a way to measure these outcomes. Um, um, uh, said subcontractors, um, enhance their, their academic growth, enhance their growth in areas of curriculum, reading, math, STEM, um, expanding our ways for professional development, um, hiring educators, hiring social workers, hiring mental health counselors. These children are coming with more and more issues and more and more problems um, that I always think we'd run great programs and great activities, but we need extra funding to help us equip the, 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 the staff in order to deal with some of these. Um, in addition, uh, enhancing our community partnerships. I did mention uh, professional development for our staff. Um, in, in effect, in essence, more quantitative evaluation of how our programs really are impacting these children. Um, uh, it would give us a chance to really track the trajectory of the par participants' educational performance and attainment, and like I said, and like everybody said, investing in these programs, investing in these kids, really means investing in the future of New York City. Um, and that's really what I wanted to end with, and I thank you for giving us, all of us this opportunity to speak. Thank you so much. I, I wanna thank you, um, not only for being so patient, for, um, you know, uh, hanging around to share your wisdom with us, but um, for the work that you're doing, you know, in terms of advocating for young people in New York City and being a partner with us, um, making sure that um, the numbers, that the statistics are there and reflects the realities of all of the programming in, you know, in New York City. And with that, um, you heard an awful lot today about you know our need for data and 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 we want to know if these decisions are being data driven or they're arbitrary whatever you know we want to know the metrics involved and so one of the things that council member um, chin and i are very concerned about is the waiting list and you know how many young people go unserved and um and we're not able to get that answer and we're we're told that you know that data really isn't being collected so is it possible that you might be able to help us with that can you share the, your information with us so that we can begin to compile you know um, a list you know um, I feel like we need every piece of ammunition that we can to um, to approach the administration um, in terms of the budget, and everybody brought up really salient points about the importance of 
not only funding, maintaining funding, but increased funding and and where that funding goes and the value of, of programs. Um, and we need to be able to have a cogent argument. And so we need some data to help support our argument, um, which I want you to know is your argument. Um, we are completely um, on your side with this. And I want to thank you for um, mentioning the fact that um, one of the things I think we haven't done, um, and there's a method to my madness, is uh, that we need to thank the mayor for coming around and seeing it the way, you know, through the lens that we presented. You so articulately presented that, um, that we need summer camps, we need summer sonic, that, you know, it's truly a no-brainer. And the administration did come around, albeit late, um, but they came around. And um, I want us to thank him on the 17th of, uh, of October um, to let him know that we, we understand that he had to overcome some hurdles to, to get to that point. We want to thank him for it um, because we plan to continue to advocate very strongly for it. And he's pretty much said to me, and I'm saying this on TV, but he said this yeah. to me yeah. that, you know, um, that I, I, that we probably will have to fight really hard and that he doesn't see, you know, us being at the same point that we were able to get to, you know, in fiscal year uh, 19's funding, so uh, f this year's funding, fiscal 18. So I just, um, I want to say thank you to all of you. Thank you for your patience and your time. Um, I am going to um, speak to, um, our side of the hall about, you know, um, providers being turned away. Um, I think that they just didn't think that the response would be what it is, um, or else we would have been given uh, the chambers. So um, I think we've made a statement how passionate youth service providers are, um, and that um, I apologize. Um, please extend my apologies to those who were not able to be here. So with that, I want to thank you very much for a very productive um, hearing today. And this hearing is adjourned at 4 o'clock. <laughs> what is it? Oh, 357. Excuse me. 357. <laughs>